Welcome to Battle English, where the pen is mightier and the language is the true battleground. There will be three rounds. Round one, critique combat. Round two, grammar gauntlet. Round three, lesson showdown. Remember, this is a fun, friendly, educational battle. Discussion of topics, questions, and answers is encouraged. And for everyone watching at home, you can learn more about Battle English at WeSpeakEnglish.com. In today's battle, we have Jeff Anderson, aka Fluent American, aka The Flutinant, taking on Colin Monroe, the Silver Tongued Brit. The judges of today's battle are Gideon from Let Them Talk TV and Jason, aka Fluency MC. Hey guys, are you ready? Let's go! Critique Combat. Now let's start round one. In this round, we will show you short clips from YouTube videos and you need to identify mistakes, correct errors, and explain how the topic could have been taught better or improved. Remember, points will be awarded for correctly identifying and correcting mistakes for insightful and constructive critiques. Oh, hey, John, how was the exam? Oof. It was bad. I'll fail. I'm not happy. Don't worry, dude. You will pass it. No, I was tired during the exam. I couldn't focus. I don't feel good. Let's go grab a cup of coffee and forget about all of this. Sorry, I feel bad. I'm tired. I can't come. See you later. All right, see ya. So, what did you think about that first clip? So uh, yeah, I, I I thought he was he was great. I I really like. Uh, is this pop English? Um, I think POC, I think it's POC English, the name of this channel, and uh, he does make very good videos. Uh, I don't English is not his first language, so he does. There's a few minor mistakes he makes. The only thing I picked up in this one uh, was the use of will for the future. I think he said I will fail, um, whereas will we tend to use more when we're making a uh, decision in the moment. Uh, sort of in a restaurant, for example, what would you like? Oh, I'll have the I'll have the salmon or whatever. Um, whereas in this case, he was sort of predicting a, a future, um, like a, situ a situation. So it wasn't really, um, yeah. So will probably wasn't the best word. I would have said I'm going to fail is is more would be more natural. Um, other than that, though, I didn't really pick anything else anything else up. Oh, well, thanks, Colin. That was ex uh, excellent feedback. Jeff, do you agree? Something else you might want to add? Yeah. I mean, first of all, just I know just like the kind of one, the impetus is for like even just starting this whole series is uh, like demonstrating non-native speakers in positions of authority with the language, which I think is great uh, because they have so much to offer. So the fact that, you know, he's having a very successful channel with it, I think is just something I want to highlight just to start. Um, with regards to the will thing, I, I, I get that point. I think something else that may have also helped make that sound more natural, because I think it can work, speaking again from like a North American context, if focusing on the contraction, because the reality is that will is a, such a relatively rare word to actually hear spoken. Instead, what we tend to do is it tends to be contracted. So even for instance, when Colin was giving the example, but he even switched it to the contraction, right? Because he said, I will fail. But then when he was talking, he said, I'll fail. And I think if he said, oh, I'll fail or something like that, I think in that sort of situation, that could work. There, there are some other little pronunciation things. I'm a, I love grammar right now. I focus a lot on pronunciation. So that's kind of the thing that I gravitate towards the most. It was the vocab lesson. I, I thought that in general, the vocab was fine. I didn't really have an issue with grammatical things I heard. But I think that and again, coming from a North American context, some things that stood out for me were, for instance, the uh sounding good. Um, I feel it was a lot more good, good versus like good, good. Uh, we're seeing just some placement things, right? He, he's projecting from a higher position with a little bit more closed off. He's not using his diaphragm as much. Things are a little bit tighter and that causes everything to kind of rise. It's, it's almost like he's kind of speaking more from like up here for a lot of his speech versus, you know, getting more resonance and things like that. That that was especially noticed for good. My guess is probably because of the G sound, probably closing off a little bit. I would also say, for instance, for the word exam, we're missing some of that 
kind of like that nasal shift that happens when you go from an ah sound to that m so more am am we're kind of missing that part so exam versus exam the and probably the biggest thing is that i think he had a series of very short sentences and in general in english when you have thought groups one thing that American English really likes to do is it likes to shift the pitch that you're using, because if you don't, that's how you end up with speech that sounds a lot flatter and sounds a lot more robotic. So he had that sequence like, uh, I am tired, I can't come, da, 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 da. like it's like pissing the same key on a keyboard over and over. And something that I think would have made that sound a lot more dynamic is if we had shifted some of our pitch registers when we move from one thought group, or in this case, a sentence to the next, like I'm tired, I can't come. I'll fail or like, I'm tired. I can't come. I'll fail. You know, like it, depending on the type of emotion you want to convey. So those are the things that stood out to me. Yeah, so you, you, when you hear someone speak, you want them to sound interesting. Yeah. Interest is certainly a part of it, but this also comes to issues regarding comprehensibility as well. The reality is that you can have really great pronunciation as you're talking and an issue can come up where if you don't have enough pitch contrast, it can actually make your comprehensibility drop, even though you're technically pronouncing all the sounds correctly. Because again, coming from North American context, one of the things we see is that, you know, a lot of other languages have harsher consonant sounds. They have other indicators to separate words. You know, when your consonant sounds are heavier, you can get like a choppier flow, like the, 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 and things like that. American English doesn't really have that because the breath is flowing so much. So pitch isn't really something that's just cool or to make you sound you know convey emotion it's also in my opinion used as a demarcator to indicate where does one word end where does one group of words end and where does the next group start and if you don't have that you end up with speech that sounds like this and speech like this is really hard for but, your listener to understand you think he was doing I, I thought he was doing it intentionally though to a large extent this sort of flat intonation because the point of his um, video, his sketch, was to show to uh, learners of English that, yeah, you should use richer adjectives because he was so using the same adjectives all the time. And perhaps part of it was, yeah, well, th th in my sketch, I'm using boring adjectives and flat intonation, and I'm not contracting as much as I should. And I think he conveyed that very well. I think the guy is, uh, is, is fantastic. He's a non-native speaker, isn't he? Um, but uh, he's he's obviously very very good at uh, sort of uh, conveying his message, and uh, yeah, I I think I'm not sure, but I, I think a lot of that flatness was was what he's he was doing intentionally, and perhaps there's like a part two of the sketch where he does it better. I haven't seen it, but uh, what do you think? Could that be the case? Gideon, are you yeah, saying yeah. He, intentionally, he intentionally did it to show? That it what 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 doesn't work when you don't use it. Yeah, I think so because that was that was the whole point of the sketch. You were saying this was like part one, hmm. saying yeah, I'm happy, I'm sad, I will fail, I will do this. Well, that's true. So, that, that's really changes things because we're critiquing something to show how it could be better. Yeah, but he's trying to critique it himself. Yeah, it was kind of sort of self-deprecating and things. But I, I I'm just imagining hmm. that there's going to be like this oh, moment where he's going to come back and do something uh, extraordinary. And with vocabulary think? too, maybe instead of saying, hey, do you want to come over? No, I feel bad. We wouldn't really say it that way. So he's going to come on and sort of say there's a better adjective. To well, well, that's well, that's what it said at the end of the video. Really happy, hmm. sad, bad. No, you can do better than that. Right. OK, I guess that's, I that's what he, that's okay. what he said at the end of the of, uh, of the clip. OK, Colin. Yeah, yeah. I, yes. Yeah, I, I agree uh, with what Gideon's saying. <laughs> and and also the, the focus of the lesson is is on the, the vocabulary. And yeah, we only watched the first 21 seconds of it. And I think that's probably what he, he goes into later on in the video is he, he also talks about idioms in the title. So I think later in the video, he's going to yeah, talk about some idiom, idiomatic expressions that. Um, so Colin, yeah. you were looking outside of the box and not only focusing on what he was saying. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. But, but, but he it's, say it's that. interesting he said that, because but... it means that anything that he's doing, if we're saying, hey, he might be doing it wrong or could be doing it better, we can go back to the fact that He's trying to demonstrate how not to use English. Exactly, exactly. All right, everybody, here's the second clip. 
If you choose to embark on this program, there is no pressure. They offer a 30 day money back guarantee, so it's completely risk free to try it out. Use my link in the description to register for the free info session. And if you decide to proceed with a course, you will get $500 off. This could be your first step towards the life of your dream. And now back to the test. Um, I thought overall information was delivered very kind of typical promotional style i think it fit what she was saying i think there were if we're going to talk about kind of presentation it sounded like she was reading off a teleprompter and one of the reasons for that was the way that she was linking her thought groups together typically what she was doing there were kind of noticeable pauses you'd have a three four five word phrase slight pause three five word phrase slight pause three five word phrase and things like that a couple little things that came up uh, like missing articles like for instance she said they offer a 30 day money back guarantee versus they offer a 30 day money back guarantee other things as well with regards to compound now compound nouns in stress patterns uh, so there was one that she used a free info session so there's a free info session it, it's always tricky with compound nouns because even native speakers will depending on the situation not necessarily the stress in the same place, but in general with a compound noun, you would have expect, expected the stress to fall more on info, like a free info session. Uh, but I thought that one of the things that she did was in contrast to the first video, whether it was intentional or not. In this case, what we saw was when we had switches between thought groups, we did get some shifting. So like, like this will bring you like to the life of your dreams. So like the first steps towards Da, 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 so you, you had these like kind of gradual um, pitch shifts between the thought, um, which I thought was uh, pretty effective. Okay, Colin, how about you? What did you think about this clip? Uh, yeah, I mean, I thought it's a, it's a great clip. Um, Lingua Maria, she really knows what she's doing on on as a YouTuber. Uh, she does make a lot of mistakes, but I I I am totally happy to forgive her uh, for, for that because I think she makes such great videos overall. Uh, the only sort of mistake I picked up on this one was the the week form that, that Jeff already mentioned with the mm. um, 30, 30 day trial, I think she was saying. And I, I wonder whether she just made the uh, so weak that it was inaudible rather than missing it out. I think if you listen carefully, you can you can sort of hear hear it a little bit, but it's just so weak, perhaps. Um, and, and we do that. We, 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 we make those articles very, very weak when we speak naturally. And I think maybe p possibly because um, because she's not a native speaker, it, it just got so weakened it, it was completely inaudible. Um, but uh, yeah, that that's all I, I have to say on that one. I noticed you, you're you're focusing rightly on her uh, uh, English because this is what this video is about, uh, and her English is 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 amazing. So again, once again, she's a non-native speaker. Uh, my, I had no problems with that. My only problem was her extreme uh, hyperbole. That's like you speak uh, when when you do her course, you'll have you'll live the life of your dreams, and uh, I, 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 I only that's the only thing I took issue with. Uh, the market, I don't know that the I get... <laughs> yeah. Where do I? I was thinking, where do I sign up? Uh, On the other I, hand, if you to... want to learn a marketing language as a second language speaker, then you know. Although, when I have to say this, the first time with the life of your dreams, I couldn't really get it. I don't know how idiomatic that I have to listen to it again. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it, but for me, that was a little awkward. Now, from from a linguistic point of view, is that the expression we usually use? You'll get the life of your dreams. You live the life of your dreams. Yeah, it's, there's some something's not collocating for me there. I don't know what it is. In not that here? it's wrong. It's yeah. you know, but just that it doesn't seem like it's. Uh, but as you, as you mentioned, as uh, you uh, Jason, Jason, when you heard it, did she really say "life of your dreams" or "life of your dream"? Yeah, I actually made a comment. I wrote down the thing about did she use the indefinite article or not. The second time, I I, I think she did. I, I agree with Colin. I think it's just weak. It's there, but maybe not. Um, really not so important, obviously. But the the is there an S on dreams? Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I heard that actually either. I mean, but I don't think that's what made it hard for me. Um, because it's about comprehensibility to me more than like you know how how accurate, especially with a, a second language speaker. But when she said that the life of your dreams the first time, I couldn't really catch it the way i think she wanted someone to catch it quickly again because not because there's no s at the end of dream but for me it just it just didn't seem 
the expression seemed idiomatic enough. I have to go back and listen again. Yeah, I just got one little thing to add. I'm, I'm just looking at the um, the transcript of the video, uh, and I searched for the word dream, and she does talk about some of her dreams earlier on in the video. Uh, so that does contextualize mm. that that comment what, about what uh, living the life they? of your dreams. Does, does, does she? Uh, uh, she says, "I always had I." I had always dreamed of exploring the Amazon rainforest. She says that earlier on in the video. So that gives some context to, you know, living the life of your dreams that she says in that, in that moment. So speaking English and discovering the Amazon rainforest. Or living her dream. Well, that was her dream. Yeah. yeah it's, uh... <laughs> well, do you think she wrote that herself? Cause it seems like sort of some sort of marketing uh, material. That she was reading out well yeah she was marketing her course i think but but did she She's write probably, it do you think she wrote it herself probably did she, did her team, I mean, that's what did her team well, uh, did her yeah, team write who it? knows who knows she's saying it so that's the important thing yeah um as you said colin you went back to it but the the thing is we want to focus mainly on that timestamp, you know and it's good to have that background content to look at it but when we look at the timestamp of the clip um that's where we want to know what is this dream dreams she's talking about life of my dreams mm. and yeah, that's that's what yeah we... but i do think that context is essential and because some you can say things in in a con in a certain context that on their own taken out of context would sound completely wrong but within that context it it makes more sense so i i can see why someone like her um inspires people i know she, she's come under criticism for, for whatever i don't know but but she's a non-native speaker and she's she's got a really excellent level of english she expresses herself very clearly with a good accent and for uh that and she's achieved it what what uh, other you know learners of english uh, uh um want to achieve and uh, and um me as 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 a native speaker I, I don't have I don't ha I can't inspire people in the same way because I was I was I, I'm born a native speaker I've never learned the language I haven't been through that process but she has and she's achieved it so yeah I can see why she's very inspiring. It's her experience, yeah. Yeah, oh, well, okay. yeah, and, and and she's also got a lot of charisma and she's very and a lot of a very good uh, screen <laughs> presence and you know so she hasn't got yeah. eight million subscribers for nothing and she's good at marketing let's hope we probably, I should yeah, probably yeah. learn one or two things from her on that yeah i think we all it's can all yeah in the job. <laughs> all in your job okay guys well that was a that was a good round here What's is the, clip? the next clip for me to be standing here amongst all of you on this very special day of yours not many years ago I was there among all of you and I wish that all of you become more famous, more richer, more powerful than me. So the, the main thing that jumped out of me was the use of uh, comparatives. She sort of listed, uh, I, I wish that you will become more richer, more powerful, more or, or something. Well, and she said, and yeah, more richer is not the correct comparative form of the adjective rich. Yeah, we only use more and then adjectives are more beautiful when it's a longer adjective. I think the, the rule is like two syllables. Um, so you would say more beautiful, but with shorter adjectives, we add the ER on the end. So rich, richer, and then richest is the uh, superlative form. There was a couple of other things I, I wrote down and I can't uh, understand my notes. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll leave those for Jeff. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad Carla noticed the uh, comparative form. I was paying attention to other things, so I totally missed that. So I'm glad he mentioned that uh, with the, the more richer. I was always having lived in the past in states, for instance, like Texas, there are situations where more being used with a comparative form, like like more better is probably the easy example, is something that you can certainly encounter even in native speaker speech. In general, I think that the biggest thing that kind of stood out to me is, is again, pronunciation, kind of similar to what we've seen with the previous people. She She's projecting from a super high position. Uh, it sounds to me almost like top of the throat, back in the mouth area, maybe a little higher than that. And this is having an impact on uh, vowel sounds and consonant sounds. Uh, 
we see this for instance on some of the r sounds occasionally she's getting like some rolling r's like when she's saying like like reach and like things like that um part of that i think it has to do with placement whereas again general in english we can't really roll our r's there's also like situations she's kind of like bouncing I, I feel like at times between like a like american pronunciation and british pronunciation and maybe also her first language uh which can be seen for instance in final r sounds which at times are present but then in other times get very softened to the point where they disappear which yeah, again but, is but you're 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 making comments about about her as if she's speaking american english but she's not she's speaking um indian english which is something uh quite quite different maybe maybe she's following the standard patterns of of the way that they pronounce english in in india which is why I tried to mention the fact that <laughs> I'm seeing inconsistencies with the R sound because sometimes yeah. it seems to be firmer and then sometimes it seems to be softer. So it seems like whatever <clears throat> pattern of English you're using, it seems like there's multiple influences having an impact on her speech, mm -hmm. which is yeah. what, again, the hopefully viewers can uh, be paying attention to. We also see this having an impact, again, with regards to placement on consonant sounds, for instance, like an L, um, which is causing some vowel sounds get really closed off you can see it for instance on a word like special and, and things like that you end up with like a loud sounds like uh, 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 versus like an oh or like an oh uh, and depending on the context you're going for and this is also leading to some potential issues with, with consonant sounds for instance like a th sound versus like a d sound which you can see for instance again in a word like there which sounded very similar to when she said i felt to the word there so again there with a d versus there with a th so those are the kind of the things that jumped out to me. Um, okay, yeah. And Judge Jason, MC Fluency, do you have Fluency MC? Sorry, do you have something to okay, add here? Common mistake. Um, yeah. I, well, first of all, um, going back to to grammar, um, I think you. Know, I think I wish you will. So I think I mean in most again, it's back to the prescriptive descriptive grammar uh, issue here. Just looking at uh, last week's battle, there was a lot of talk about that. I mean, a, a native speaker of English, I would think from anywhere, uh, but I'll speak myself as someone from the U.S., you know, you hear all the time, you know, uh, I, I wish you will, I hope you would, but, you know, mixing the real and unreal. Um, but it would be more standard. Again, what is Indian English here and what isn't? I don't know enough about it. Um, to be able to say, like, if 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 consistently people say, I wish you will, instead of I hope you will in Indian English, then it's different. Um, but, um, you know, I wish you will is generally not what we say when we talk about the the real uh, conditionals. Uh, it's, I, I hope you will. Um, so, yeah, the, the Indian English thing is interesting to me because, you know, Jeff has such uh, amazing, like very precise remarks about her pronunciation. So the question is, is she uh, someone who would say, oh, yeah, you're right. You know, English is my second language. Because, you know, people in India, some of them grow up Economy. learning English uh, very early in school and some don't. So it's it's definitely a stereotype, a generalization is to assume that someone from India, you know, Indian English, like Canadian English or South African English, it's not necessarily like that. Uh, so I think it's really important to consider uh who she is is she a first language is she a native speaker in the sense of indian english or is she not uh, yeah i, I think uh, remember she, she she's indian and she's speaking to an indian audience so i think they're they're going to understand her also I, again i'm not an expert on indian english but i know that they have differences as far as the rules of the grammar are concerned in indian english I'm trying to think of an example. For example, I like the plural of person in Indian English, often persons rather than people that we would say. Uh, and even remember, like, you know, between British and American English, there are a few uh, grammar differences. If in America, if a British person said, I, I just saw Peter, you said, no, no, no I, I've just yeah. seen Peter. So I, I think that there is a yeah, great so difference the in yeah. For the purposes of correction, it's really important to think about consistency. Like, you know, what, what are... <laughs> Are people saying it always like Tilly, she said it or not? And I just wanted to quickly, as I probably have to jump to the next thing soon, I, I wanted to just point out one other thing about more richer. So certainly, you know, what Colin was saying about the short adjectives for one or two syllables generally, but not always, right? Having the ER instead of the, the more. But I, I think uh, in many cases, I don't know about in this case, um, what's happening is they want to say much. <laughs> So when they say more richer, there's this idea of much richer, and they don't have that form. I, I've seen many cases of that in France, where once students understand, you know, they, they want to say, I know, but I want to say richer, but even more. Oh, that's much richer. 
Uh, and another so, another another mis mistake a lot of people make similar to that is they use too much they say too much you could mm. say so much but a oh, lot right, of people yeah. don't don't realize well, that, that changes the meaning doesn't it right exactly too yeah much. a lot of people but, yeah. don't realize that difference right. too much and so much but the intensifier um, much is, is yeah. something that you don't a lot of people don't get when they get it. it's like oh my gosh that's what i was looking for <laughs> much I did actually remember the other thing that I noted down. I understand. I figured out my notes. Um, at the beginning of the clip, she says uh, something like, it's a pleasure to be among all of the you. She says the, the you. And they fixed it in the captions. So they it doesn't say that in the captions. But what she actually says is the you, uh, which we shouldn't have the, the article there. Okay, so basically in conclusion, but as we noticed, it is, as, as Gideon said, as Jason said, it's Indian English, let's call it that. So just because it follows different rules, does that mean it's wrong? And I imagine, I mean, you're you're South African, so I imagine in South African English, that there's going to be a little bit different to British English or American English, the, the grammatical rules. I don't know to what extent. Exactly. I don't have that expertise. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard it's hard to argue but we got it on on that note there's you know there's 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 lots of variety in in english and and we we oversimplify things to say british and american because you know what people talk how people speak in the north of england is very different to the south and and in the states it's there's a wide variety as well um and there are people who are like no british english is the best it's the original that's what's right everything else is wrong um and that's one attitude but i think i think we need to be tolerant of of a wide variety of things uh of 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 um you know the way ways people people speak and and the important thing is that people are expressing themselves and having a different accent um maybe even you know slightly different different way of using the language is all part of that um that uh diversity yeah. exactly yeah, yeah. Exactly. that's true Okay, guys, so Judge Jason. All right, everyone, it's time for clip number four. Roll it. So when people speak at a faster pace, use linking, which a lot of language learners don't even know about. And even if they have heard about it, they might not know a whole lot about how people use it in speaking in real life. Okay, Jeff, so what is your opinion about this clip? Uh, it was good. It was clear. Uh, she had some variety in terms of how she was expressing herself, but again, kind of focusing on pronunciation. Some of the things that stood out to me, again, focusing on an American English context, you know, so, so take what is appropriate for your own um, English journey is things that if the goal were to sound a little bit more natural in American English thing that I think would help with that is especially again, going to be related to <laughs> Same as before, placement, we're still projecting from really high positions. It's again, almost kind of like if I were talking like from up here for everything I was saying versus if I actually again engage my diaphragm more. You can see this in a couple of situations. You can see this again, we're seeing L sounds at the ends of words that are again, kind of causing things to shift really high. You see this, for instance, the word like people, like people uh, uh, versus like people. Uh, uh. Um, you can also see this having an impact on some vowel sounds. So again, like I think one of the reasons why a lot of English learners in American English struggle with differentiating a short I sound like the E versus like the E sound is again a placement related issue. They think they're pronouncing an I sound when in reality everything's kind of going too high. So for instance, a word like linking can become like linking and things like that. Other things that you see this on other, other vowel sounds, again, it all, potentially impacted by the L, but could also just be because of the diphthong and a word like life become like lie, lie versus like lie, lie. So just again, trying to shift things a little bit lower there. And then again, if the goal is to achieve a more natural sound in American English, one of the things that could be beneficial to look at is the letter T because the letter T just has so many different ways of being pronounced. And when you actually listen to native speakers talk, those T sounds, especially if they're in any other position beyond the start of a word are not typically going to make a t sound so what we're seeing we're seeing situations where don't even know becomes like don't even know and that's not even necessarily an issue it's just something that in general when you hear native speakers talking especially in a conversational context when things are coming a little bit faster a lot of times those t's are going to get softened a lot so don't even becomes like don't even um 
and this also occurs across sentences and thought groups as well. So like, for instance, uh, there was one situation where she said about and even if versus like about and even if so concepts, for instance, like a held T or a stop T sound I, could help a lot in terms of linking thought groups and words together in a way that just sounds a little bit smoother. But again, these aren't even things that native speakers are necessarily using 100% of the time. It's just something that in general, if you're trying to allow the breath to kind of keep flowing that I think would be pretty beneficial. Well, those are some good points. Colin, what do you have? What, are, what is your feedback on this? Yeah, well, Jeff's done a, a, a great job of uh, talking about the, the pronunciation and things. Um, there was one other thing towards the end of that clip. I think she said um, something about a real life. Again, you, the, the article should have dropped the article there or, or she put it in when she shouldn't, you know, because we talk about real life, but she said a real life. So uh, that that was um yeah, that was my only thought on that. And to going to referring to what what Jeff was, I mean, he did an excellent job of uh, a, a analyzing the pronunciation of things. But it's interesting how you know when we speak as native speakers, we do so many things where we bend the rules. And people, when they're learning English, they often, uh, well, they they always don't know when when to bend the rules. It's a, a kind of stage of the learning process and uh so so some of the things that, that jeff was saying is actually that she's more right than 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 native speakers because native speakers we you know we know we can break the rules like with the, dropping the t's and yeah things like that so yeah it's a very interesting observation uh but yeah jeff did a, did a better job than i can of talking about the pronunciation so yeah what he said <laughs> that's actually i mean that's very often what i end up telling students who work with me because my goal is especially with students like focusing on like a natural sound versus like a clear sound because in general i mean i think you probably experienced this too i mean probably everyone here has where students come to us and they already speak in a way that's understandable and clear a lot of times the issue isn't necessarily i mean yeah there's still gonna be moments where people may ask them to repeat themselves or things like that but in general they already are speaking in a way that's understood and yet they're still having this idea that it's not enough. So that's usually one of the very first things I tell students is that, hey, look, the things that I'm going to be telling you, were, I, my focus is not clear English. I don't really care about clear English because if you want clear English, you're probably already there, you know, honestly. You know, my goal is a much more natural sound, which means we have to kind of break down some of these expectations and things if the goal is to actually achieve a native speaker sound, if that's your personal goal, cool. Um, so then we need to start changing some of our expectations so clarity and confidence is what you're looking for, basically. Mm -hmm. Fluency MC, well, anything? Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm work? really glad you brought that up, Jeff, because you really answered a question for me about, about your uh, approach as a teacher. Uh, because, you know, I could tell you the type of person that values comprehension over, you know, perfect native English. You're not one of those people. At the same time, your observations are really... <laughs> technical about accents so when you know if I, I i like how you're saying you know um maybe somebody's goal is to be like a native speaker but I like your goal is to be more natural um that's that's really interesting because i think that's that's an important goal for some it's not important for everybody uh maybe comprehensibility is enough but i think you know uh, natural in, in somewhere in between on the continuum of like you know comprehensible comprehensible and like native like which you know i hope we all loathe that whole area of of, of our of elt but anyway uh yeah and i just wanted so that that's great that you you mentioned that that really helps me understand uh, your approach better um one other thing though did anyone notice i think she said um uh when when speakers speak at a fast paced use linking so i don't know if you know they use link they was admitted again it's, maybe it's not a grammatical mistake maybe she just forgot to say it uh, but i think if you listen again you'll notice uh, maybe she's trying to say you should use linking, you know, talking to her audience, but the sentence, the way it's, she constructed it, it should be they use linking and just uh, back to more natural collocations use linking, you know, I don't, I don't think it's as natural as maybe link words uh, together, I suppose, you know, linking is the concept, I don't know how much you talk about you, you should use linking, but just collocation the observation. My interpretation of that, and again, there's not enough context, it was, it's, it it was literally taken in the middle so the way it sounded to me just based on intonation patterns was it was part of a list to me it was like when native speakers do this use okay. linking and like but i don't ah, know if the okay. other part got 
attached onto it. it but that also right. happens in speech, right? Because sometimes you're talking and then like you start a list, but then you don't actually finish your list because you get sidetracked just on a tangent. Um, so I wasn't, exactly. that's how I interpreted it. So that's why it didn't stand out to me personally. And I, I totally get what, what uh, Andre is saying about how, you know, we need to focus on the on the clip. The context is not important, but it's um, it's a little tough. I mean, it's good to show like our skills at noticing things, but you know, it, it's it's hard to be sure that uh, about about our observations, I guess, sometimes. We always need more, but we don't always get it. Basically, yeah. Okay, <laughs> this is we're good. we're on such a good roll, guys. Okay, so Judge Gideon, are you ready with clip five? What does it mean when someone asks if you're high? Well, that means are you under the effects of marijuana or any other drug? That's basically what it means by being high. Now, this is proper English. Everyone understands this. Uh, you can go to the doctor and a doctor can ask you, were you smoking? Are you high or something? And everybody understands that. Now, I'm, I'm not saying high is a medical term. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying it's proper English. You can find it in any dictionary. Someone being high means they're under the influence of a drug. Let me phrase it this way. What were your first, your first thoughts when you opened what? this clip? Well, my first thought was that he's forgotten to put a shirt on. And then and looking at it, the title, it says phrases from Eminem's Superman. So he's analyzing a song lyrics um, from uh, uh, from Eminem. So and yeah, he, he's talking about um, what it means to be to be high in, in that in the context of that song. Um, I, I didn't really pick up any any errors um, in the way he was speaking uh, or anything like that. Obviously, he has a very different accent to me. But there's nothing wrong with that. I don't know. That, that that's more Jeff's area, I think. <laughs> the no shirt, the the body, did it throw you off? Like what's happening? Um, maybe a little bit. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, he's got, obviously got a very different accent to me. But it's there's, I couldn't really find anything wrong. I mean, he speaks very differently to me. The use of w w vocabulary and some grammar things, but I don't think any of that is wrong. It's it's regional. Um, he was so, at least wearing um, a tie like you are. So you have something in common, You're both wearing ties. Yes. Yeah. I, I, maybe I need to get outfits. a hat. Maybe I need to get a hat, though. He probably I looks so. at me and He'd thinks, say, oh, put I forgot the shirt to wear on. He'd say, take the tie off, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Depends, on, yeah. depends yeah. on your brand, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Jeff, were you surprised with this clip? Anything you found? Again, even like in terms of his speech, his, his speech is actually still kind of applying general standard rules like it's not like we're not getting a whole lot of like for instance like vowel dropping um we're not even necessarily getting this like removal of like sounds and things like that the one thing that's really happening is it's just i've already mentioned again in american english context just the amount of breath you need to kind of just link things together and that's literally what you're hearing in this case you know he's not saying for instance like under the effects you know he's saying under the effects like under the effects like it's just that sort of slurring of words together is what American English kind of allows you to do just because of the fact that it emphasizes the breath so much. So what we're, what's happening is we're seeing some super weakened consonant sounds, which again, if someone's arriving in a North American context and you're not prepared for that, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be a rough couple of weeks. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you because native speakers, if you're like actually out kind of like interacting with people on the street, this is how, you, you can certainly find people that are going to talk. Uh, but again, nothing grammatically stood out to me, um, even in terms of vocab choice. I mean, he's he's going over lyrics, but again, everything to me is actually s still sounded pretty technical. Okay, so in, in the video, he said it's proper English. So the way he spoke, the way he presented, is it proper English? I mean, and he said it's in all dictionaries. Is it an old dick? That, that's a question we need to think about when he was saying that. So again, like I didn't catch sort of like I feel like people that would turn this on might expect it to be like, oh, there's going to be a lot of slang being thrown at me. There's going to be a lot of uh, massive amounts of crazy reductions and things like that. And granted, I listened to it like one and a half times, but there wasn't really any of that really happening to me. The, the forms he was using to me actually sounded pretty standard. I didn't hear a whole lot of non-standard forms personally. He, he's a native speaker, right? 
Is he? He he would convince okay. me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, 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 well, I don't have the uh, you know that information. The background. I think, I think uh, no, yeah, I don't know his background, but he sounds like a native speaker to me. But one th one thing I gotta say, which I think is really interesting, is I I listened to it uh, while you guys were talking a few more times. And I found two very obvious uh, grammar mistakes. So that before I talk about what those are, if it's okay to do that really quickly, it, it I think it's great that you didn't notice it the first time because we only hear people say things one time generally, and it's not important, um, you know, because it didn't inter interfere with comprehension. Um, I'll give a hint uh, about one one of them. He actually uh, corrected. He said it again the second time the correct way which shows that it's not that he doesn't know how to say it, it's that he noticed a mistake as a native speaker. Um, that's one. Uh, you might have to watch it again to to be able uh, to, to catch it. And, and the other one has to do with the active or passive voice, the form of the verb that he chose. And, you know, that could be put down to uh, dialect, uh, but I don't think so. Yeah. Okay, okay, well, did, I don't know, one of the challengers, maybe did you pick, did, did that hint help you? Did that hint make you realize something you might have missed? No, I mean, obviously, you know, just just seeing it once, it, it's very difficult, yeah. <laughs> like you said, to 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 pick things up like that. And uh, when you when you just listen to somebody, you're just trying to, you know, they're just expressing themselves and you're just trying to understand. And you don't think they made a mistake. You know, that we, we're just trying to yeah. uh, understand what they mean. Um, so, we, yeah, it's we're very forgiving when, when we mm. listen to things. It's only when we sort of try to analyze things and... Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure what the mistakes are that you're referring to. Okay, though, well, with that, Judge Fluency MC, are you ready to provide us with the last clip? Okay, guys, let's get ready for the last clip. Let's go. Every single type of T that we use in American English, I'm talking about the flap T, like in water, uh, the glottal stop, like button or stop T that typically comes at the end, like uh, pat. All of those are, including the silent T, all of those are optional. They are not mandatory. If you say water, it is not wrong. Sure, it might be weird, depending on the situation you're in, but it's not wrong. Okay, Jeff, in this, let's say in this battle, you have been the king of pronunciation. So this one was just made for Jeff. Oh my God, he was, he was just talking about this. I, that's what ago. I thought when it started. So <laughs> Jeff, I mean, this clip, your thoughts, what are they? I mean, in terms of the actual argument he's making in the video, yeah, 100%. Uh, it's the idea that, again, you can just use a regular t -t for everything and People understand you just fine. But again, as he mentioned, you're going to sound weird. And it's true. Um, again, especially focus on a North American context. I, I personally didn't notice any odd grammar, um, odd vocab things. Maybe Colin did. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave that to him. But nothing that nature really stood out to me. Uh, if someone's goal is to to sound natural in English, and I think for for all varieties of English, again, I, I really can't stress the importance that English places on pitch for for separating things. And you could catch it right in the beginning where he says a sentence like this: like every single time, every single type of T that we use in American English, I'm talking about the. Do you hear how he starts like way up here, and then by the end he's all the way down here? And this is something that English learners are generally just missing out on entirely because they're usually using a range of maybe like four pitches. Like this is my high, this is my mid, this is my low mid. That's probably about as low as I go. So you're probably using about that range. But to really start getting that natural range, you really kind of need to double that. And that's that example that he had in the beginning, I think, really kind of captured, honestly, like a necessity that if your goal is to get that natural sort of sound, you need to be able to hit like the really high stuff. But you also need to really take it down as well in certain moments. And I thought he did a great job, job of demonstrating that. Diversity, we need that. Colin, what do you think? Uh, yeah, that that's really interesting. What 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 Jeff says about uh, the pitch, um, and yeah, I think this is basically: do we agree with the 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 speaker's main point of um, is it always right to pronounce your T's? Um, and I think Jeff summed it up when he said, "Yes, it is right, 
but you might just sound a bit weird sometimes. And as teachers, should we teach that sort of, should we go into all that, those details when, or is that going to just overload students? Isn't it better <laughs> to, to teach them that correct way, which might sound a bit strange at the start, but then once they're comfortable with that, move on to the, the next, sort of next level and the different varieties of um, pronunciation that, that the speaker talked about. It's a question that I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure about. I, I open that up to you guys. <laughs> I mean, Carl, I, I would ask just a reference to your own, I'm, I get the concept of, you know, you don't want to overburden your students. So what do we do? We oversimplify. Oversimplification, I think, can work if you address it at some point. But I think what ends up happening a lot of times, and again, you guys have all taught, so you can also speak to your own experience on this. But my experience has been that it's like, oh, we'll talk about this later. Well, here we are later, and we still haven't talked about it. So if you're going to push a topic to a different date to discuss, fine. But just there better be a date. Like there, there's a time frame on this because you can't just keep pushing it to the side. So that's why in general with my students, I say, hey, um, I'm going to throw everything at you. You know, we'll do it slow. We'll scaffold. We'll control it. But I don't want you leaving my class being like, oh, well, we never even encountered this. And yeah, I'm hearing it all the time. I think that if I have to choose between oversimplifying and never addressing complexity or introducing the complexity early on, even in like an incursory way, then I'm going to personally choose the latter. Okay. Okay. So excellent. Well done, both challengers. And now our judges will give their comments and award points. Okay, before the judges award points and make a final decision about who to crown the champion of this battle, I need to remind everyone watching that the judges chose the questions, the topics, and the videos. They have had more time to think about the questions than the challengers in the battle. And they don't have to defend their answers or face a competitor. Our judges are simply providing their professional feedback and even though they are the judges, they may not always be right. So always make your own decision about what is correct or incorrect, but more importantly, always be yourself no matter what language you speak. Our challengers are the real heroes of this battle and we should start by applauding them for their valiant performance. Judge Gideon, how do you think round one went? So both challengers did exceptionally well. And I, obviously, I, I didn't know either of them before I came in to this battle as a judge. But uh, clearly, I see the, the, strength, the strengths of each one. So Jeff is the pronunciation expert, and his comments were extraordinary. The level of detail that he went into way beyond my knowledge we all have our, our our level our fields of expertise but uh he had an extraordinary knowledge of pronunciation and i think colin he is very insightful and ve um very analytical uh and he's good at I think he, of course, he knows pronunciation, but I think more in general terms, he knows uh, the grammar and things that they both did exceptionally well. Um, before I award the points, I'll think I'll pass over to Jason, see what he has to say on that matter. Judge Fluency MC, what are your feelings about the first round? Yeah, I, I agree with Gideon. Um, these are both uh, competent teachers um, with there are different approaches, different charisma. Um, they uh, definitely took it seriously, like watching the videos. It's difficult just watching it uh, one time, <laughs> trying to pick up things. As you said, we were able to uh, look at them longer. So for me, it was more uh, just did they catch any initial uh, errors that, that or things that weren't good or, or things that were particularly good. I have to say, I feel like um, we, you know, we focus more on 
problems and there weren't so many problems with the videos they're kind of like little things um than what was uh maybe uh good about them um but uh i think i think in terms of uh catching uh things that could be improved really both of them i mean i think jeff's strength is also his weakness sometimes to, for me because he he knows so much about it that pronunciation as as uh Gideon has said that he um i wouldn't say he missed other things but he kind of just went so deep into it like if i were the teacher listening to that i'd be like well that's interesting what you're saying about my pronunciation but I'm just a second language teacher focusing on vocabulary here uh, or, or grammar here. So, it, you know, he demonstrated his knowledge of that, which is important for us to see as judges. It definitely factors into the, just how how good he is, that knowledge he has. Um, but it wasn't to me always appropriate for uh, that the particular, particular video. Um, Colin, uh, I feel noticed pronunciation that was, you know, contractions, things, things that were um, sort of more important to catch, of course, uh, Jeff did as well. Um, and I guess what what I like about Colin is it maybe also his, his strength and weakness. Like I think he's uh, less, um, you know, less analytical. I mean, he's insightful, as as Gideon said, but um, you know, in a way, it sort of makes him more uh, approachable, possibly as as a as a teacher, um, depending. On who students are, of course, um, but also uh, there there are areas uh, which we will get into the next round where I feel like he he may need uh, a little more experience, uh, a little more knowledge uh, compared to what he what he has right now. And so both of you judges felt um, Jeff Jeff he I named him the pronunciation king um, in that battle. But as you said, Judge Fluency MC being let's say a second language teacher teaching English as a second language is pronunciation mm. that important? should we focus on it that intently every time we speak or mm. when we hear someone speak well I think it's also that because the videos I might have to do with some of the direction we're giving them uh and I feel like maybe I missed missed an opportunity here to ask them more questions about what what they liked about what the teacher was doing to start a note and also what could be improved more from a teaching style or approach perspective because it was it was more like you know where are the errors so I think when 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 there weren't a lot of errors Jeff went right into like how that person's pronunciation yeah. uh could improve do you know what yeah. I mean Gideon? So exactly how I thought because the videos we saw the clips we saw I didn't really notice any errors I think maybe Colin picked up on one but their level of English was so good and I thought then that's why Jeff stepped in, because mm. that's his field of expertise, pronunciation. And of course, they're non native yeah. speakers. So there's always going to be certain things that uh, you can say that they that they don't say like a native speaker does. So that's why perhaps if it was a sort of lower level student with, with, with lots of errors, Jeff certainly knows the grammar. We we saw in, oh, yeah. in other <laughs> clips, he certainly, he certainly knows that stuff. But he thought that's the thing that we should be doing here. There, there were a couple of sort of glaring errors here and there. Like I wrote down here, there was one, you know, uh, more richer. Uh, but even there, we were we were looking at uh, a, a a person from India who was not a teacher, by the way. <laughs> she was it was just critiquing uh, her uh, her speech. Um, so it's more yeah. about catching that. And then and then the other thing is um, the yeah, there, there was one um, one in particular, one of the clips I, I have some notes here about it, I wanted to mention, um, which is Phil Klenko in, in Siberia, where he where he said, um, you know, you're you're uh, under the effects of a drug. And then later he said under the influence, he corrected himself. And then he said, that's what it means by. So it should be that's what is meant by. Uh, you know, we watched these clips several times, so, you know, it's easier to catch them. But I have to say when I I did challenge them and I said there was, uh, you know, a collocation mistake and uh, a grammar mistake and neither of them, neither of them uh, could figure it out. <laughs> so but again, I don't know. Is I think if they watched it again, they would. So uh, I think the most important thing from that is that the fact that they didn't we talked about this, the fact that they didn't catch certain mistakes. Uh, shows that uh, what's important is, you know, the message, the meaning, that the little grammar mistakes or colligation mistakes that don't interfere with meaning, we, we might not even notice. 
Exactly. Do you think maybe because that specific clip you're talking about, the way the teacher appeared might have <laughs> might have thrown us sure. all off? I mean, I was I was surprised. I'm okay with seeing. I know I know who Phil is, so I'm okay seeing without a shirt. But but here's what I mean about a missed opportunity. Like what we you know we're focusing so much on errors. The fact that he was saying that the word high is a word in the dictionary, it's not like total slang, you know, uh, you can, you know, a doctor, it's not medical English, but it's, it's, it's a common term like that. That's really good advice, you know, shirt or no shirt, like, you know, little grammar mistakes or no grammar mistakes. We didn't really talk about that part of it. So, yeah, I, th I feel maybe Jeff was in a difficult situation at times because his focus is on um, getting the speaker, getting his, his student to speak more in an American way, mm. but the clip about American English, about Indian English, they don't even yeah. want to do that. So mm. he's saying where their, their, their flaws are from a, an American right. perspective, but yes. maybe it wasn't appropriate in that, in that context. And, and what's interesting about that is that from, from what I know about this guy, um, <clears throat> he's he's not he's definitely not a you know speak like an American like as as a no goal no or, no not at all yeah. no right 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 but that's what's interesting like that if 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 that were where he's coming from it'd be very easy to just be like hey you got to stop this you know it's more like he's very tolerant and open to all kinds of accents and people etc he's just very specialized uh, in yeah. in this way kind of can't get a, get away from it <laughs> maybe he's just, he's just thinking about absolutely it. Well, we don't know she, the 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 Indian speaker may have come to him for lessons to say hey i want to speak more like an american we don't but and that's what what he or, would, or the opposite would have said. Yeah, no, yeah, or the, no interest, but, no interest yeah. in changing her accent yeah right? yeah exactly exactly but we we don't know but he's just doing the thing that he he, he, sure. he does so well so i, I don't sound like a criticism because uh you know he's 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 uh he, it was he was spot on with what he's saying it was, it was spot on but maybe it's just I, the I, context I think... was wrong yeah, and just uh, on, on, on back to Colin. I mean, I think I really I felt like he's a very humble person and somebody like very open uh, to learning. So I did sometimes, as I said before, got a sense that maybe he, uh, you know, doesn't have as much experience as Jeff or maybe uh, other other teachers on the, on the program. Although I've seen different people, but um, but that he's he's somebody who's going to grow and like he's super smart and uh, seems very open. Uh, to to other ideas about about language learning. Yeah, I I I think he's really personable. You feel like you could get on with him mm. as a teacher when you you see him. You, yeah, you, you, there, there's sort of he he instantly sort of connects yeah. connects with you. Um, I think I said Jeff is more sort of like the technical technical side. If you agree, I mean, I'm sure. you, you're so personable. Um, I don't yeah, want, yeah. I feel like I'm criticizing either of them. I'm just uh, sort of pointing <laughs> to Colin's uh, probably straight because they're both outstanding. But um, you know what yeah. I mean. Okay, guys. So, have you any thoughts about the points for round one? That maybe who takes this round? For me, it's pretty even on this one. I have to say, and I think they both did did well. So yeah, I'm going to give them three each. I, I think instead of sitting on the fence all the time, <laughs> I'm going to give three to Jeff and four to uh, Colin. And the okay. only reason, the only reason why I'm giving uh, uh, Colin an extra point is because the only thing, uh, the, the only reason I thought I thought Jeff maybe he had like a one approach fits all. And when we were looking at the, oh, I've got the first clip, the guy was sort of speaking ironically and, and intentionally mm. speaking in a wooden way. And I, I think yeah. uh, that should have been maybe recognized and maybe, yeah. uh, so, so that's, that, that's maybe sounds a bit harsh, but for that reason, oh, no, I, I get I'm, I'm going to give Colin, who gave good responses throughout Mm. Uh, I'm going to give him an extra point. So I'm going to pour to Colin. Okay, so that's round one. Stay tuned for round two. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss the next round and our future battles. Click subscribe now. Grammar Gauntlet. Are you ready to start round two? 
In this round, we will ask you questions about the English language. You'll have 10 seconds to think about your answer and give your response. Remember, this round is focused on accuracy and correctness. Try to use rule-based explanations. There are two people and living among two different cities. So, so this is an interesting sentence. Um, not quite sure what the, the context would be. Um, the main thing that jumps out to me is the use of the word among. Uh, so there are two people living among two different cities. Now, it's sort of, it, it makes sense, but the word among we normally use when something is, you know, within lots of other things. Uh, you might say, um, well, there's an expression, there's a, a cat among the pigeons. So if you imagine a cat in a big crowd of pigeons, that would be the correct use of the word among. I think the fact that we're talking about two different cities and cities being static things that don't move is one thing that makes the word among inappropriate there because we don't say I'm, I live among a city, even though it does surround you. Um, and um, the other thing is the fact that we're talking about two people. So I think what the, the speaker is trying to say is that, um, yeah, there's two people and they live in two different cities. I think that's what they're trying to say. Um, so, yeah, the use of the word among there is the, the main point. Okay, and Jeff? What did this sentence say to you or not say? It's a similar issue with among. I probably would have replaced it with in for that same reason that among kind of implies a much larger quantity. Um, I think in is going to be your more natural preposition here. The other thing that's kind of jumping out is that conjunction and I probably would just remove it. In fact, when Colin said it, he just took it out. Like there are two people living in two different cities. The, the one thing I, I will say that I, th I think is working well, and I'll go back to the end and what happens with removing it. But I just want to point out just kind of like the parallelism that's happening with like two people, two cities. And a, English really likes that. English loves when things are able to kind of pair together um, across sentences. Um, so if, if people aren't familiar with a concept called parallel structure, it's something I, I just strongly recommend because it appears everywhere. Going, going back to the living. So basically, you have two clauses that you're, you're trying to join together. It could have been two independent clauses. You know, it could have been there are two people and they are living in two different cities. But basically what they did is they're like, I don't want to use a clause. I want to use a phrase. So they took off the they are and then you're left with the living. But the problem is, again, that and is in the way. So you, that's why you need to take the, the and off. So then it would just be turned like you're just describing people like there are two people living in two different cities. Final answer. Final answer. Okay, okay. So, uh, Judge Fluency MC, are you ready to give us the second sentence? Okay, guys, that brings us to our second sentence. Let's go. He's inherited his wealth by his belated uncle. Uh, looking at this one, so he's inherited his wealth. To me, I'm not seeing any issues there. So he's inherited his wealth, the contraction with he has, which sometimes I see students not contracting like not being like confusing he's which is understandable because it can if you just have it by itself it's like is it he is is it he has um, so some of that confusion but besides that i think the biggest issues happening in the second half of the sentence with our prepositional phrase uh by his bladed uncle i, th I think prepositions are if, if i had to rank like the most difficult parts of any language, I would probably put like articles, if your language has articles, and then prepositions, you know, we can argue about the order of those two. I, I think it's very frequent for students have issues, for instance, in this case, with from versus by. Um, so I, I would personally opt for from. Uh, so from his and instead of belated, I think they meant late, because I'm guessing, again, if we're inheriting something, I imagining unless the uncle did something to cheat on insurance or something like that. I'm guessing the uncle's dead. So my guess is that instead of belated, it probably should be late from, from his late uncle is how I would adjust the second half of this. Final answer. Okay, thank you, Jeff. And Colin, what were your thoughts when you heard and read the sentence? 
Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think the main thing is uh, the buy. It should be you inherit from somebody. Um, and it's very interesting that the word belated. I didn't the first time I read that, I didn't pick up on belated being being the r- totally wrong word, which I should have done. But that it is it's funny. I guess because of the word buy, that just draw my drew my attention. But yeah, it's very interesting how in some contexts, late and belated mean the same thing, but not in this context. Um, so um, yeah, so late uncle or yeah, late uncle would be the be the best there. Um, but yeah, nothing 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 else to add to, on to what Jeff said. Do you think um, wealth is a good choice of adjective? Can you actually inherit wealth? There's nothing in a will saying that I leave my wealth to my nephew Colin. Well, it's quite it's quite vague. I don't think it's wrong. Obviously, his will would be more specific um but in this context well wealth you you um, inherit it's a you noun. inherit you inherit a fortune you inherit money you Depends. inherit property but you don't inherit wealth which you can inherit wealth i you think need. i think you can yeah we need uh, to put that in quotes and put it in google to see if there's a collocation uh I, i'm sure you'll find there is one maybe not as much as the others you mentioned but i think inherit wealth is common enough i may be wrong yeah no, I think it is, yeah. Okay, are you guys ready for the next one? If I was you, I will quit my job behind that. Okay, so this is a uh, question about conditionals. This is a conditional structure, uh, but it's a bit of a mess. Um, and to be fair, conditionals are quite complicated um, and something that really kind of doesn't doesn't make sense in it well yeah there's rules but they're very confusing so it's understandable that somebody would make mistakes with this so if i was you so that's the condition and then the outcome i will quit my job now this presumably would be a hypothetical situation um so I think it's okay to say I, if I was you, but it would be better to say if I were you. Then and then you would say I would quit my job. So we keep the tense the, the same, even though mm-hmm. it's um, it's it's sort of a hypothetical situation. Um, uh, yeah. So if I think it would be better to say if I if I were you, I would quit my job. And then when it says behind that, that's also not quite right, and I'm not quite sure what they're getting at there. Um, so behind that, maybe after that, or, um, if they, if they, if they had a negative experience in their job, um, and yeah, so talking about conditionals again, there's several different types of conditional. I'm not sure. I think this is the second, I'm not sure. I don't, I, yeah, I, I can't remember exactly which conditional that is. Um, but, uh, yeah, talking about a hypothetical situation, that's the, um, that's what's the important thing here. I've, I've recently been debating with myself a little bit because I've been doing some videos on tenses. And I've seen some videos that talk about conditional sentences as if they are a, a tense. Personally, I disagree with that because they don't follow the same rules of, te- of tense using like auxiliary verbs and, and things. If you, So it'd be interesting to know what other people think about that. In the sense that if every sentence needs to be in a tense, then conditionals, you'd need to call conditionals a tense because sometimes conditionals are, sentences are, are a conditional. But yeah, they're very different from the 12 tenses. So in terms of the grammatical structures. So yeah, interesting debate. Okay, that is quite interesting. Jeff, Um you have a face that gives you away, especially when when Colin mentioned the videos that he's been watching um, about the tenses and all that. So I'm interested. I'm interested to hear what is your feedback on this sentence. No, unfortunately, I don't have anything striking to add. I kind of changed it the same way I would have. Um, if we're going super standard, if I were you, I would quit my job after that. If we're being a little bit more open to things, probably the more frequent way you're going to hear it is if I was you, I, I would quit my job. If you're going even more reduced, if I was you, I'd quit. Like I'd quit my job with the contraction. 
Um, and the way I interpreted, again, the behind it, I also interpreted it as after that. Like, it seems like, again, there's context. So this is just imagining a context. Someone's telling you a story. You're responding to the story. It's something related to work. So this implies a kind of negative situation at work. Um, and that's why I think that after that, after that situation, that's kind of implied by everything that's said here. So that's why I think after, again, again we're just seeing some pre preposition confusion, like after versus behind, you know, behind typically referring more to like a physical space after having more the temporal aspect to it. Uh, yeah, and treating um, conditions as tenses, that's pretty whack. I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> uh, but besides that, yeah. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> People would be crazy. Well, uh, okay. Yeah. I'm glad you agree with me. Yeah, because I just yeah. saw a video with the title, All Tenses, Including Conditionals. I was like, but they're not, they're not tenses. Um, mm. But, yeah, I mean, if you define a tense as every sentence needs to be in a tense, then I guess you could argue that. But they're so different that it's, yeah, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. It break it breaks the logic. If you want to teach what tenses are, it's help it's useful to to look at the logic, how how we use the auxiliary verb and the main verb and the subject. And then so if you're saying if you're saying that's tense, then it makes sense. There's a there's a consistent logic between all the tenses. But if you throw in conditionals and say they're also a tense, then it just breaks that logic, it makes it very difficult to learn and teach. <laughs> Fluency MC, are you ready to provide us with the fourth sentence? Yeah, yeah, everybody. I think we're already on to sentence number four. Check it out. At the supermarket, she bought five potatoes and six carrots. The thing that jumps out the most is just the apostrophe S, which would show, in this case, um, singular possessive, but we're not possessing anything. We're just trying to buy some vegetables so take off the apostrophes and you'll be in pretty good shape um one, th one thing i do like is the order english in general likes to do small then big um it's like five six so i do like the fact that they put five potatoes before the six carrots and they did great on prepositions so like we're always really happy about that so we get to go that. that's all i got great soundtrack and yeah, good. Okay, so Colin, what do you think? Well, I think I think Jeff's nailed it with that. Um, yeah, when when we put the apostrophe in on in, on potatoes and carrots, it's saying that something belongs to the carrot or belongs to the potato, which is not what we're saying. Potatoes and carrots cannot own things. <laughs> um, I'm not sure whether maybe there should be a comma or could be a comma in between supermarket and she at the supermarket well no yeah no 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 i think that's fine as it, as it is yeah can i ask a question well, what about the word order is that okay for you you mean between carrots and potatoes and carrots do you want no, to move that to supermarket oh actually to the yeah, yeah you know yeah, what just more yeah so you incorrect. talked about yeah no yeah 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 that's interesting actually because um yeah, because Jeff mentioned the the size thing, but yeah, now I can see what you're getting at, uh, Gideon. Yeah, I think in the way I speak, I, it, saying carrots and potatoes would be more natural. That seems more idiomatic. Um, no, I'm saying uh, might well, be, Jeff uh, mentioned uh, already got the size. Uh, what I was hinting at. No, uh, the maybe after supermarket should be at the end. Uh, what she bought would... for potatoes and carrots at the supermarket. That's, Wouldn't that, that be more of a style, a style question? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Style but it sounds more natural think... to me, no? Well, it depends on the context. So we can't. I don't think we can criticize that. Absolutely, we it could be blah 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 the at the drugstore, at the supermarket. She right, like putting into yeah, we don't have the context. It's true. Show, exactly. exactly. So we can't say that it should be at the end. But maybe on its own, I agree. If it's just on its own, I would probably put it at the end. I have something to ask. Basically, um, looking at the sentence, do you think a native speaker would ever write this sentence maybe an anally retentive one yeah because <laughs> she, going into the detail we don't really say we would just say some carrots yeah. just bought some 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 some, some carrots veggies. and potatoes <laughs> yeah yeah i don't think 
the number of them might be relevant if someone's asking you to buy them sort of thing you, you need to get the right amount but if you're just telling someone that someone else bought some carrots and potatoes we don't know how big the we, potatoes are anyway so if you're saying get me five potatoes yeah you would need to specify the type be, um, of potatoes short changed <laughs> <laughs> yeah but but in this in this context it's um it's reported speech right we're, we're talking it's somebody talking about what someone else did so presumably the type of potato and all that's not relevant so i think in this context it might be better to say some potatoes some carrot and some carrots but colin and Jeff, I would... could I, this, this this may be what uh or maybe not what andrew is saying but is it possible a native speaker would use possessive incorrectly when they meant a plural is that possible yes. or is that just it's native? a very common that mistake yeah the, it's it's called the greengrocer's um uh posture isn't it or something <laughs> yeah so it's got that's the name so and maybe maybe not so egregious as this but definitely right misuse of yeah definitely yeah or we see that plural, all the time. Uh, it's not just an not just an english learner non-native english speaker learners okay everyone so judge gideon are you ready to give us sentence uh, i'm ready, five? I'm ready. Five? they invited the strippers jfk and stalin yeah, I'm really not sure what the context of this would be. It, it looks fine, grammatically speaking. <laughs> um, the only thing is, the and uh, should there be a comma between JFK and and? And it, is this what the the Oxford comma is all about? I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure, but um, Jeff's giving me a thumbs up, so yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, I think that, so. I think the Oxford there's there's debate about when you've got a list and you we put the word and between the last two, um, and we would put a comma between all the others. But there's the the debate about the Oxford comma is should there be also be a comma? Between so so the what's last the possible and misunderstanding and. then? There's no debate. There should be a comma. I just want to be clear. <laughs> in my in my opinion. <laughs> But it has to do with what Gideon's getting at. Is there an issue with understanding or not? So 90% of the time there isn't, but 10% but, uh, of the time I'm just making this up. If you don't have the Oxford comma, then it changes it, right? It has to do, I'm not gonna say anymore. There's there's a term that uh, Gideon used earlier or last week that might be useful here. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I suppose reading that, just that sentence on its own, you you might be confused and thinking, that it's not a list that JFK and Stalin are the subjects. <laughs> um, and that, I mean, that wouldn't be quite right, but sometimes people might say that. You might say, um, you know, they went to the shops, John and Colin, you know. Um, so, yeah, that could create some confusion and putting the comma in there would help with that. Is there, I wonder whether the, the order should be a specific way. I'm not sure. Strippers, JFK and Stalin. Uh, should it be, would it be better if another way? I guess it depends on the context. Uh, I think if you added <laughs> J. Edgar Hoover, then it might have been appropriate for stripper. Apparently the rumors are true. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> Jeff, do you have anything to add or maybe a different opinion about this? I'm, I'm very, very biased. I really like the Oxford comma. I think it's great. One of the greatest adventures of English. Good job. Um, but it's not necessary, so you don't have to have it. But then you do run into some ambiguity issues. So there is, as Colin mentioned, there is that chance that JFK and Stalin could become they, but there's also the chance that they could also become the strippers. I don't know how else to put it. JFK and Stalin could become the strippers. <laughs> I don't know who, who would want that, but uh, you, there you go. Can oh, I just God. ask you, then, wh why are you so passionate about the Oxford comma? I think it's great. I think aesthetically it's very pleasing. I, I talked about parallel structure. Like I think just having that little repetition is really nice. I think that it makes a clear demarcation. And there are times where, again, there can be some ambiguity issues that come up if you don't. Well, what's the What's the like the panda eats, shoots, and leaves? Oh, yeah. Um, or like whatever... The, I forget the entire context, but you know, having commas, not having commas can have an impact on how you interpret a sentence. And if you put the comma in, suddenly everything is magically clear. So I just, I'm a big proponent of the comma. 
Mm, yeah, I think I, I agree with you. I'm actually very close to Oxford Oxford now, so I, I suppose I have to. Claim it. <laughs> Claim it, yeah. Yeah. Guys, I, I got to jump in, though, and uh, let's not forget, like, when, when someone's saying the sentence, the difference, whether it's, you know, apposition, that was where I was thinking of, or a list, uh, is completely different, right? So, uh, Gideon, you read this one, right? So, how did you read it? I, I don't remember. Could you read it again? They invited read it. strippers, JFK, and Stalin. <laughs> I'm not sure I read it like that the first time. But, uh, so if it's, if it's, it if it's apposition, which is actually how I thought of it, you guys might think I'm crazy. I mean, I am crazy. I really thought like JFK and Stalin, it's more likely that those are like weird stripper names than they actually invited <laughs> strippers. So for me, it was they invited the strippers, JFK and Stalin. Got, because of course, the Oxford comma doesn't work in spoken English. So uh, well, well, right. Yeah. And that's why I think it's so important in written English because yeah, yeah, exactly. you can't hear how it sounds. So without it, it could be either way. Absolutely. If there's any, if there's yeah. any ambiguity, put it in. Yeah. So, so there's a big it. difference between saying they invited the strippers, JFK and Stalin, and saying... They invited the strippers, JFK and Stalin. Yeah, they invited the strippers yeah, who that, go, are named yeah, or because that makes it are. sound like you're naming them. Yeah, like you're saying. So, Judge Fluency MC, can we have sentence number six? Okay, guys, here comes sentence number six. Are you ready? He's got such a large amount of friends that you could never count. The sentence to me just feels incomplete. Uh, I feel like we're missing an object or some sort of phrase. So like that you can never like count them all or something like that. There's such a large number of friends or a large amount of friends that you can never count them all reference back to the friends. Besides that, just another um, option in terms of vocabulary choices. I, if I were saying this, I probably would have said number instead of amount, but it doesn't mean amount is wrong. And the other thing that's happening, so you see you have this adjective clause that you could never count in its current form. And grammatically, it's doing the, the best it can because when, when you have an adjective clause, you really want it to go as close to the noun that it's describing as possible. And that's in this situation, that it, that's about as close as it can get to a mount because a mount is really the kind of the noun that it's describing. Colin, what do you think? Yeah, I think, again, Jeff, Jeff's nailed it. I, I do think, though, that the, the word amount uh, is, well, maybe not wrong but but definitely not the best word like 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 just uh just said um because you would talk you use amount more with the sort of uncountable nouns you know there's a um there's a large amount of snow or there's a large amount of uh but i guess you could say a large amount of people um so but but still large number of people is is it feels better okay judges anything you want to add maybe a hint I, I have a few things. It's interesting what you say about amount and number. Um, I would say number is correct, but I understand that a lot of people would say amount with accountable. I think it's a gray area. A lot of native speakers would use it. Personally, I would say number. Uh, also, I don't know if this if this counts, but got such, even if you use number, got such a large number of, is that really a very idiomatic? Book. Yeah, Isn't it might be more natural to say a lot of. He's got a lot of friends. Yeah, so many, <laughs> a lot of, uh, so many. I would, yeah, something like that. I, I would just, it just sounds a little bit cleaner. I, I really feel like with the such a useful structure for students, you know, I mean, it's wonderful that this person used such correctly <laughs> with a noun. They didn't say, you know, uh, oh, yeah. so large amount. <laughs> so that's great. They're using such correctly. But in this case, the, the 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 expression that's really useful is so adjective that, right? That would be like the so many that, using many as the adjective. So when you said so many, the first thing I look at when I see this is so many. Like it's great to use quantifiers, you know, a large amount of pollution or a large number of, and you can see the way that you guys are kind of thinking, like, is it, is it okay to use, um, uh, you know, amount with countable nouns? It's shifting. Like you see it happening, like compared to the, I mean, it's, it's at least in North America, it's crazy how many times now you hear uh, amount, you know, I'm still so prescriptive in that way. I'm like, no, it's countable, not large number of, but yeah, that's really shifting. 
not quite in the grammar books yet, but probably we'll get there. But I think it would be great if we're talking about teaching this to say, this is nice, but uh, uh, he's got so many friends that you could never count them, you know, and using the pronoun at the end. I think that's the most natural. Okay, everyone ready to roll with sentence number seven. He's got a lot of friends, even more acquaintances. Interestingly, this uses the expression a lot, like we were talking about that they should have used in the previous one. Um, so I'm okay with that. Um, the the I'm not sure about between friends and even, whether it should say and even more acquaintances or or maybe just a comma there would help. But uh, other than that, I, I would understand it. <laughs> um, nothing else really jumps out at me. I think it's mostly fine. Jeff, what do you think? This is the correct spelling, yes. Uh, a lot probably should be separated. Uh, a space lot. So a lot of friends, even more acquaintances. Yeah, and then um, you could probably get by with a comma just between friends and even. Um, I wouldn't be opposed to the conjunction and. He's got a lot of friends and even more acquaintances. If you did it with and, you could keep the comma or you could remove it. Um, more frequently, people are going to remove it. So like he's got a lot of friends and even more acquaintances. I just want to ask a question because you were just talking with the Oxford comma. You're saying you would you be okay with a comma there even though what follows it isn't an independent clause? If we use and, I mean, a conjunction, you'd be okay with a comma? No, you're right. Yeah, I, I probably wouldn't put a comma there because there's no... You don't have another like verb and things like that, so there's no there's no even subject and subject switching. So in those cases, yeah, I would just I would just use and. Let's move on to sentence number eight. And here it is. They met at university and worked together in hospital. So we we got some like British English versus American English things going on. Uh, that's not my forte. British English, some of the little grammar things, I really can't speak to. So I'm going to defer to Colin. If you wanted this, if you're using this in a North American context, um, a lot of times it's university is just not the, the word of choice. Like you don't usually ask someone, you're like, oh, like what university did you go to? Like it's college. Like what college did you go to? Um, North America is pretty unique in that aspect because I think pretty much globally university is going to be the more kind of standard form uh, but in the u.s if you want to sound more natural college like they met in college not at college they met in college um and work together hospital in general in american english you would expect it to have a the uh again just sticking to my own area of expertise uh for your other types of english there are better teachers for that um and Work together in the hospital. In the hospital is fine. I probably use like at. They work together at the hospital. Personally, I would use at, but I don't think in is necessarily wrong. Uh, yeah, so if I were doing this, again, in a North American context, I would have personally done this as they met in college and worked together at the hospital or at a hospital. Yeah, so in in the UK, college is a, is a different thing to university. Um, college comes between what we call secondary school, which you call high school and university. Um, well, not necessarily. College can be a, a different thing in, in, in its own right. So uh, now some schools will do that high mid level between university and the basic, basic high school education as well that we call those a levels or well, they used to in my day. I think it's all different now. Um, and then you go to university but then there's some colleges that do that middle level where you can do your A levels at, at a college. That's what I did. Um, but then colleges also do more vocational courses and things like that. We have things that we call B techs and stuff like that, which then don't necessarily you don't necessarily do them to go to university. So yeah, we just have a different education system. Um, so this sentence seems fine to me in that sense that they met at university. Yeah, that seems fine. Um, and work together in hospital. Um, yeah, I think I think Jeff Jeff just mentioned all the things. Um, at, maybe better to say at hospital or in a hospital. Nothing else to add. Are there no missing definite articles somewhere uh, in that sentence? So maybe you could say the hospital, but you wouldn't say the university. 
you definitely wouldn't say they met at the university. Colin, did you think they worked together when they were sick? Yes, <laughs> yes, that's my question. No, no, well, I, the way I understood it is they studied together at university. Right. And, then and they, they got chronic on... illness. But my, my understanding of in hospital, even though I'm not from the UK, mm -hmm. is that it means well, the same as in a hospital or in the hospital. But I, I in hospital means you're a patient, no? Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. I see what you're getting at. Maybe that's right. But I did that's why I said I think at's better. I just couldn't really Right, but it sounds like you were properly. agreeing with the he was pointing out that in American English versus British English, but I think even in British English, in hospital has a different meaning. <laughs> in hospital, yeah, right? Yeah, no, with the with the British American, that was just referring to the word university and college. Um, which is totally spot on i'm just i don't know gideon do you know you, you know what i'm saying right i know exactly what you're saying yeah but i mean it's possible that they were chronically ill and then what during their time they shared a room and they were working together but i would in that case i would say in hospital but if they were employed by the it, um, it's yeah I use, yeah I no i think i think no? it's it's far more likely that yeah they were employed there and that's why at sounds sounds better but um, but but yeah, we're, so that's not the question about at. It's about. I don't her. think it's at. I think I don't. Think, it's I think her. it's the definite article, right? In yeah. a hospital in British English, no. Yes. In um, a hospital, as opposed to in hospital. But I, but Gideon, you should take this. No, no, you 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 absolutely you absolutely that that is spot on for for from because so um, if you're working, you say I work at the hospital. You don't say I work at hospital. I work. You could say in. I think in or at. I'm not sure. I think, but I think. British is in. more likely to be in, wouldn't it? I work in the hospital. Yeah. I work at the hospital. I, I, I now I'm confused myself. But anyway, but my my point is about the definite definite article. I think if you're unemployed there, you'd use the um, you'd say that. Yeah, and in American English, the equivalent would be like if you said like, oh, you know, where's your where's your friend today? Oh, he's in the hospital. What happened? Oh no, he he works there. No, no, you wouldn't say in the in the hospital is in hospital for us, right? Meaning you're a patient. You know, where's your friend today? Oh, she's working at, right, at the hospital or in but, a hospital. Yeah, like oh, yeah, so it is really different in Not British the. and American. Once you do in the, you're, you're saying you're my, sick. My friend's in hospital means you're sick. My friend works at in the American hospital. In American English, you would be in the hospital. Uh, okay. Yeah. We have okay. to have So hang on, can I just say, are you, are you saying to say and work together at the hospital is wrong? No. No, no, no I, I'm saying there's a very interesting, I actually know the etymology of this, it's really <laughs> interesting. it has to do when, when hospitals started and American English broke off from British English. But anyway, in hospital, meaning you're a patient for American yeah. English is in the hospital, in the hospital. It's, it's like, but it's really interesting because we don't say in the school, we say in school. And that's why in university, at university, why are we using this indefinite, so the, uh, definite, so the definite article is, is, is strange here, you know, be in prison. We don't say in the prison, but with hospital, we say in the hospital. So you That's say doctors, the doctor works in or at hospital or the hospital? A hospital in or the hospital or the hospital. The so British here. English should say, the, uh, Colin, if you you, you 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 agree with me, the doctor works at the hospital, works at, at the yeah. uh, works at the hospital, not works at hospital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The British English okay. makes a lot more sense. The doctor <laughs> got food poisoning and he's in hospital. Yeah, like in school, in yeah. prison. Yeah. yeah. It makes more sense without the the. Okay, everyone. So, um, yes, sentence number nine. If you wish to speak more concise, use less words. You need to use the right words and concise is not the right word there. It should be concisely uh, using the, the the adverb form because adverbs affect the verb. So we're talking about how the person speaks. So it should be the, the adverb concisely. Um, and the other thing would be to use fewer words rather than less words, although I... Although that's right, and I think that, that that's right to say fewer rather than less, that's one of those things that's really creeping in to the language using less um, in, in this way. So normally we would say less with uncountable and fewer when it's countable, 
but less is getting used more and more for either. Um, so it depends how how strict you want to be with the old fashioned original rules or whether you want to use the language in the way that everyone else does. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, so those are the two things. Concisely should be the adverb form and um, fewer if you want to sound more old fashioned. Agreed. I think even in like super informal contexts, like you, you can see people even reducing adverbs into adjectives. Um, but um, like you might hear people say like, oh, like go, like go quick or versus like go quickly and things like that. Um, so the concisely, yeah, if we're going to like standard quote unquote, then yeah, I would expect that to be concisely less. Again, if we're going to standard, I would expect that to be fewer. But uh, besides that, um, I don't see anything else to comment on. And that's interesting that you say that you, you could even do that with the adverb. I think that might be something more in American English, because I think we would stick more to the ad, uh, the adverb forms in, in British English. Um, so it's interesting to hear you say that. I would agree with that. Yeah, I would agree. I just have one little challenge. I swear it would be quick. Guys, what would you would you ever advise uh, someone to maybe consider the word wish here in terms of like the situation when they're saying a sentence like this? It does make it sound a little formal. Um, I would probably say if you want to use, if you if you want to speak more concisely, use less words. You use fewer words, or no, use less. I'd probably say less words. Either. Yeah, I was fine, thinking that, but I mean, opinion. concisely, concisely is a kind of appropriate word for a kind of more formal sentence too. Yeah, so I, yeah, you're I, right. It didn't jump out at me. I was just thinking that is something we see a lot, right? As students, I, I mean, I'd see overusing sometimes to wish that way when we use it more often. Yeah, so wish maybe yeah, is appropriate in a for the register. More often, right? Okay, okay. So, Judge Fluency MC, could you provide us with the final sentence for this round? He sang so good and his mother fawned him. Towards the end of the sentence, my guess is they wanted the phrasal verb like fawned over him uh i'm guessing and in the beginning i mean if you're going standard you would expect this gets back into adjective versus adverb saying so well but you will often hear native speakers also use good like to do something good and things like that so you will see good used as an adverb in that way as well so we have two different clauses and they do have different subjects so in theory, you might want to put a comma after good, but the reality is most native speakers don't really know how to use commas, so most native speakers probably wouldn't even write that with a comma. So, uh, those are the big things that stand out to me. Yeah, agreed. Um, it's definitely a difference between British and American English, though, with using good as the um, ad adverb. Um, I think in British English, we definitely more likely to say well um when we say he he sang so good that does sound uh very more of an american thing so yeah that's something we, I, we do people do do it in british english as well but i think it's def we definitely do it less uh, and it's more of an american thing how do you answer the question how are you doing do you say i'm doing well or do you say i'm doing good american and british i mean I would say, I I would often say good in that context. If I'm just saying good, but if I wouldn't say I'm doing good, I'm say I would say I'm doing well. Um, but if I was just answering with one word, I'd say yeah, yeah good, thanks. Well, that's not one word, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Jeff with the American British. Mm -hmm. So someone asked, "How are you doing?" Mm. Like I, I would agree, like doing well. Uh, but you would also hear doing good. You would also hear just good. I think the more interesting question is when someone asks you, how are you? And then you get this interesting reversal because a lot of times native speakers will actually say well, even though grammatically that doesn't actually make sense. Like grammatically, you would actually need to say good. Yeah, because unless you're healthy. The thing to, yeah. the thing to remember is good is the adjective. So, And yeah, if you say I am good, then you're using an adjective to describe yourself. You're not describing how you're doing. Um, that's the thing. But, 
But it's interesting. It's also like one thing we forget, I think, is like what people are sort of have in their heads. So if you say, well, like things are going well, like, are we kind of truncating? Are we cutting off? You know what I mean? Like, so yeah, it sounds strange. Like, you know, how are you? Well, right. You know, I'm good. Adjective. I am good. So I think when, often when we're saying good, it's like we're kind of feeling like describing the noun, even though the structure of the sentence might be more adverb. But I, I have a little challenge here. Can I can I put it out there? I, I see something here that really you guys haven't pointed out that uh, reminds me of a sentence we had earlier. The structure or something we had earlier. I don't know if that's enough to go to go do, on. You, do you want do you want a that? Do you want to throw that in there? He's saying so what that his mother found out. Not that you need it, but is I feel I feel like the person most likely wants to say that. Not that it's two separate things. Like he, he sang so well, one thing, and his mother praised him or, you know, or fawned over, over him. Like you said, to me, it's not two different things. It's, it's, it's you more think, that. Is it, is it fair to say that adding that there clarifies the, the idea that her fawning is a result? Exactly. It's like a conclusion. Rather than now, something, if the person says, yeah. oh my God, that's not what I wanted to say. I want to say two things but that aren't related, but they seem so related here, as you said, like the result that, I think it's the so that. Yeah, it clarifies it. So, so well she could, that, she, yeah. yeah, she could be fawning over him anyway. Right. But <laughs> if you add that, it makes it clearer that uh, it's a result of him singing so well. Okay, that is the end of round two. Now, our judges will give their comments and award points. Great job to both of our challengers. Okay, so Judge Fluency MC, hmm. how do you think round two went? Oh, I, th I think it, I think it went all right. Um, I think you know we were talking about how I mean this is this is really used to grammar and vocabulary because there's uh, well the pronunciation did come in a tiny bit in one of the sentences. Ironically, it was something I pointed out that 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 and Jeff didn't, but but generally, right? These are we're looking at the the use of grammar, you know, structure and, and and vocabulary, and I don't I don't think anything you know major got by either of them. I think it was more how well they, you know, get back to experience. And and Jeff, even though he does pronunciation, talked about how his first level was grammar. He definitely he definitely has you know the terminology down. Um, he's got he can he can find stuff very quickly. So I, there were a few times where I felt Colin could sense something was a little off and and did it's not that he didn't explain, okay, this is a problem with a conditional or this is uh, you know, a problem with using an infinitive, but but he was a little um hesitant sometimes, uh, which I understand. Again, I think it's down to experience, I'm I'm guessing, because I feel like this is a super passionate guy who's who's super smart. And observant. So I think it's more that, you know, there were there were moments where Jeff, like, you know, uh very quickly, boom, could, you know, kind of find uh find the mistake or what was awkward. Um, so yeah, there were a couple of things I wrote down here. Um, you know, he, Connell wasn't sure about conditionals as a tense or not. Uh, for example, um, you know, we were talking about there are two people, um, among two different cities, he's he he was saying that among didn't really make sense, but he didn't really say you know, the collocation is in a city. Uh, Jeff didn't either, for that matter. So both of them, I thought, uh, could have said it's more about collocation than trying to understand the meaning. Um, there was one uh, they met at university and worked together in hospital. Um, to me, that was that was interesting because uh, I felt like. I guess I felt like in this round, like, yeah, there's nothing huge they missed, but the, it, 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 again, they don't have as much time to really analyze them. But, um, you know, they both saw that at university, uh, you know, that's that's correct for in, in British English, but uh, in hospital or in a hospital, it was interesting that uh, they both had different reasons for why that didn't seem right, that to me uh, uh, were... were we're not what they really needed to figure out, which is that, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Gideon, that uh, mm -hmm. in hospital really means you're sick. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, they're, the the vocabulary, certainly they, they, they pointed out like uh, when vocabulary wasn't used well, I think both of them, again, very 
to me, very similar. I don't know about you, Gideon. I didn't feel like, you know, one of them, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. uh, screwed this up or one of them really just like, wow, just knocked it out of the park. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, I think they both did an excellent job. And if I was, were a student and um, my teachers, I would be, um, I'd be uh, delighted because they explain things so clearly. Um mm. Because I'm a judge and uh, I have to do what I have to do, then if there's any difference, I would say any uh, um, that it's true that Colin missed a couple of things, yeah, such as the um, uh, in hospital. I'm sure he knows the difference. I'm sure he knows exactly. Big, it works in hospital. Works and he's yeah. he's in hospital. He works uh, mm. uh, in the hospital. I'm sure he knows the difference. But on the spot in that moment, uh, yeah, his uh, explanation wasn't clear. And there's one other thing. I think we I can't remember which was now with the word order. He mm. could have he could have gone a little bit deeper and and changed word order on some or simplified some of the uh, the language, which was which was a bit clunky. Uh, yeah, Jeff, on the other hand, yeah, he came at it straight, straight between the eyes, and I think he got it. He got it right. It was spot on. Most time, and he added his this extra level, the icing on the cake with the uh, yeah. the pronunciation. Um, no, did we do pronunciation? No, there's no pronunciation in that one this round. Is Not there? really. Yeah, no, we're, no, no. Well, we're talking. We're, we're, we're no, talking no. about. Uh, we're talking about the. the we're clips. talking no. about they invited the strippers, JFK and Stalin, or they invited the strippers, JFK. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That one, but nobody nobody yeah. seemed to see it the way that I did. <laughs> the strippers were uh, could have been named JFK and Stalin, and it was opposition, not uh, a series of things. No. That's true. Or, or I, maybe they're not strippers taking their clothes off. Maybe they strip paint. So if you have the yeah, same word in you know, American English, yeah, right, paint right. strippers. But but, but I, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think. I mean, here again, it's, it's, uh, I keep saying the same thing, but I really feel like it's, it's just experience and, you know, how, how often, uh, if I had to guess, Jeff's been confronted with, you know, uh, something to correct compared to, to Colin, that's just, just my feeling. So for example, you know, if you wish to speak more concise, use less words, I mean, just, you know, I think Jeff could go right to, you know, we need an adverb for concisely and, you know, mm-hmm, fewer is mm-hmm. the quantifier. I don't remember what he said, but, you know, he was using more of, of the terms more quickly, uh, not that Colin couldn't figure it out. And in the end, like like you said, uh, both of them, I mean, any student would be happy to have teachers as competent as they are who mm, could uh, yeah. explain. I mean, I think uh, no no problems there. Another interesting thing I remember popped up was the Oxford comma. Mm. Oh yeah, and they loved that. I mean, both of them was like we love the Oxford comma, we <laughs> would use it. So I mean, it's something they both could agree on. I, mean, I cannot remember. Well, Jeff that. was like adamant. It's the yeah. only way. Is the Oxford comma? I mean, comma. if it, if it's if it's simply a series of things, it doesn't matter. But like we saw here it would, it would, with the opposition, yeah. if you, yeah. you don't have a comma, it can change. You know, like um, the meaning of the sentence. Yeah. Except commas could be deadly in in in, in some cases, um, as you just said, judge fluency. They could change the meaning of an entire sentence. Mm, for sure. And yeah, when it comes to it, I I do agree. Um, Jeff was point on. He was straight to the the grammar, the rules, how it goes, mm-hmm. and um, especially we have mentioned this: the university college because mm. of its different meanings in British and American, it might have a different answer altogether. I'm not sure. And that was the great thing about this battle. We have one of each with the challengers, one who's focused on the American literacy and the grammar and the other with the British uh, literacy and grammar. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. I think that's why they, on some points, they agree. Mm. They would say, I completely agree, or Mm. would find a different mistake but like it's like an easter egg hunt are you sure you found all of the candies we yeah. like, you know <laughs> okay. exactly exactly so speaking about the easter egg hunt who do you think takes <laughs> round two again again very similar which is which which is good i mean to have to have two teachers come on 
and and it's not close would would be bad for a number of reasons i think um not the least of which like you know what can we learn from watching these these teachers we wouldn't want somebody on you know who just was a, a train wreck uh so yeah i think uh but but yeah I, this uh, on this one uh again i think it's down to experience as far as uh how quickly and how articulately they could explain what's what's awkward about the sentence or what's wrong with this with the sentence so i would i would i would give it to 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 Jeff, but again, just you know, one point more or two points more. I mean, I wouldn't give I wouldn't give Jeff a five, so that means he's a four, and I I wouldn't give uh, uh, Colin a two, so he's a three, so it's four three. Okay, okay, so four to Jeff and three to Colin. Je Ooh, sorry, Judge Gideon, how about it's, you? It's interesting what you say, Jason. Um, well, because uh, I, I was thinking along the same lines because. I thought Jeff just just uh, just great. He, he just uh, he he hit. I was going to use a baseball analogy, but I did that. he hit a home run. Is that right? No, do people say that? I don't know. Yeah, I should, they I do. Should talk so about many, cricket rather than baseball. I think you know how there's so many baseball idioms in English. <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah. It's interesting how, how some have moved over to to uk english actually too but yeah i, them, I, yeah, I yeah. hit it out of the park, park figure or, yeah yeah hit out hit of the park or, yeah or hit a hit a home run yeah yeah um yeah because so do correct me if i'm using those uh, analogies no no they're both he, okay. he um uh i thought he got it right uh, i'm gonna give him a four and I'm going to give Colin just because maybe he overlooked one or two things. I'm sure once again, also I'm sure he knows all this stuff. I'm sure he knows all this stuff. The, the pressure, the lights, uh, the, the, <laughs> the 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 battle, the judges peering into the the camera, the whole uh, setting, the whole yeah, the the the, the, the terror of it all. Uh, I, I, he he may have uh, overlooked a small points, so I'm going to give him three. Same as J Jason in the end. Okay, that's round two. Stay tuned for round three. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss the next round and our future battles. Click subscribe now. Lesson Showdown. Are you ready for round three? Here are the topics that you can choose from to make a video lesson about. Judge Gideon, can you give us your two topics? Here are my two topics. Number one. Terrible T, how to pronounce the letter T in English. Number two, email English, beyond dear and sincerely. Judge Fluency MC, are you ready to give us your topics? I'm ready. So my two topics are construction vocabulary and don't never use double negatives how to understand double negation i think i'm going to go with the double negative one um i think that's something i can do the most interesting work on in in a short time period i was hoping Is there'd there... be something on on tenses there because i've been doing a lot of work on that recently but unfortunately not but so i'll go with double negatives is there another reason why you chose this topic well, I think Jeff will be very good at these um the 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 first one on the 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 T's. I don't know if that's what he'll choose, but um I definitely think he he'd do a better job than me on that. So I'd rather leave that to him. Okay, well, Jeff, question is, what topic do you choose? I guess I'll pick the T's. I'll do the T's. <laughs> I've talked about it a lot, but that's fine. I can do I can do another video on T's sounds. That's fine. <laughs> Since it has been insinuated that you might, <laughs> <laughs> I dabble. It, it was between the T's and the construction, um, but I think because I'd like to do also something I can direct students to, and most of the students who come to my channel are already kind of focusing on the pronunciation aspect. So I feel like, in terms of what's most beneficial in the long run, I feel like the T video is probably going to have the uh, achieve more goals for everybody great now remember you have four hours to send us your video file we've given you the address to send the file to the video should be about 10 minutes long it must be your original work you can use visual aids but they must be created 
by you. No prepared material. Points will be awarded for creativity, clarity, accuracy, and effectiveness in teaching the topic. Now let's see who can make the best video lesson. Good luck. Today, we're going to be looking at the subject of double negatives in English. This topic can be very confusing for English learners and native speakers. And it's one that many people don't agree on because the strict rules don't always agree with a lot of modern usage. So let's break it down together. We'll find out why in standard English we normally avoid double negatives and how this differs from other languages where double negatives add emphasis. We'll also look into how and why we often break this rule. Have a look at this conversation. So, Bob, tell me about your weekend plans. Anything interesting? I'm not going nowhere special this weekend. What about you? Wait, wait, wait. You're not going nowhere special? So where are you going? Nowhere. I'm not going nowhere special. You're not going nowhere special. So you are going somewhere special? Or somewhere normal? Where would that be? No, nowhere. I'm not going nowhere. I'm staying home. But you said you aren't going nowhere. So you are going somewhere. No, I'm staying home. So you aren't going anywhere? Yeah, that's what I said. No, you didn't. The confusion here is because sometimes using a double negative, like I'm not going nowhere, may feel like you're emphasizing or strengthening the negation. This can be the case sometimes, but in standard English, it's actually the opposite. If you aren't going nowhere, then you are going somewhere. The two negatives cancel each other out. In some languages, like Spanish or French, adding an extra negative can indeed intensify the negation, but not in English. At least not in standard English. English can be a complicated language. One of the reasons for this is because it's a mix of many languages which have been stirred up over hundreds of years, resulting in many cases where something is right in some contexts, but wrong in other contexts. Double negatives are one of those things. So if you're learning English, it's best to stick to a standard form of English and try to avoid using double negatives until you've mastered the nuances. One frequent error is using no and not together. Like saying, I don't have no money. We use a lot of contractions in English. So remember that don't already contains not. So it should be, I don't have any money. To avoid using double negatives, you can expand your vocabulary and incorporate words like any, anybody, anyone, and anything into your sentences. These words make it easier to express negation without falling into the double negative trap. For instance, Instead of saying, I don't know nobody here, you can say, I don't know anybody here. Instead of saying, she didn't say nothing about it, you can say, she didn't say anything about it. Instead of saying, they won't let you in without no ID, you can say, they won't let you in without any ID. But as I said, 
you will hear people use double negatives, especially in popular culture. The Rolling Stones sang, I can't get no satisfaction. Shakespeare wrote, and that no woman has, nor never none shall be. And Lady Gaga sang, I'm not nothing without a steady hand. I'm not nothing unless I know I can, <laughs> or something like that. So these examples show, while double negatives may not be standard, they do have a place in the language, especially in creative expression. So in all the examples we've looked at so far, we've seen how using a double negative to emphasize a negation is not something we should do in standard English. But we don't never use double negatives in standard English. In fact, I just used one there. We don't never use double negatives. But this is a little different. I'm not using the double negative to emphasize the negation, but to reduce the positive meaning to less than what may be expected. Another example would be, I don't never go to the gym. This doesn't mean I always go to the gym, but rather I rarely or hardly go to the gym. So it's all about context and tone. I'll say that sentence again a couple of times and listen to the difference in tone between them and see how the meaning is completely different. I don't never go to the gym. I don't never go to the gym. The first one is sort of non-standard English where I'm emphasizing the negative aspect. But in the second one, I'm reducing the positive to almost nothing, but not quite. So I don't never go to the gym means I sometimes go to the gym. In conclusion, it's crucial to be mindful of your English proficiency level. If you're just starting out, it's best to steer clear of double negatives altogether. However, if you're more advanced, you might encounter situations where they are used, mainly in informal speech or literature, but don't use them in formal letters or a job interview. Just remember to use them carefully be aware of the context. So there you have it, our comprehensive exploration of double negatives in English. They can be quite tricky, but with practice and good understanding of when and when not to use them, you will master this aspect of the English language. Thanks for watching me today. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and give this video a thumbs up and I'll see you next time. Tiny, little, mountain, dentist. What do all of these words have in common? It's the T, but they all sound pretty different from each other. Why is that? Warning. In British English, this will not apply. In American English, what we find is that there are four different T sounds that you commonly here. The one that you're probably the most familiar with is the t, t. That's your initial T sound. When a T is found at the start of words, it very often makes this t, t type sound. You can hear the breath escaping. The way to make that sound is to have the tip of your tongue right there touch the top of your mouth around your ridge and your top front tooth and again it sounds like t -t. a note though that you can also get this same sound with maybe a little bit of a lower placement in the more natural breath position with the tip of your tongue actually down against the bottom of your mouth like t -t. can you hear a difference between those now this T sound typically occurs when the T is at the start of a word.
tight, ton, tooth, tango. But it can also be found in the middle of words, especially when it's part of the stressed syllable, intention. But the reality is that that T sound is just not the most frequent T sound that you're going to hear when native speakers are talking in North America. Instead, they're going to usually choose one of these three other options. The silent T is what it sounds like. You're not even going to hear the T at all. This typically occurs when the T comes after the letter N, N, N. Let's practice. I'm going to say a word twice. The first time with a T sound, and then the second time with a silent T. Repeat after me. Center. 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 Advantage. 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 Interview. 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 International. 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 Now you may be thinking to yourself, But Jeff, this T actually sounds okay if I pronounce it like international, center, dentist. And it's true, native speakers will also pronounce it those ways as well. We're just talking about some very, very frequent alternatives that you can also start using and it can give you a more natural sound as well. One sound that this commonly gets confused with is a held T, where essentially we block off the breath on the T sound so you don't get the this typically occurs when a T comes before an N sound, often at the end of a word. To demonstrate, I'm going to say a word twice. The first time is going to have a regular T. The second time, a held T. Mountain. 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 Cotton. 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 Eaton. Eaton. Eaten, eaten, written, 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 written. One thing that can often separate this held T sound from what you will hear in British English is that, and maybe you noticed it, there's still some air that moves through. You don't get the t, -t but the air doesn't stop completely. Compare cotton, cotton. Cotton, cotton, written, 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 mountain, 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 mountain. Do you notice that even with the held T, you can still get movement of breath. It's just that we're not getting that. So you don't want to block the air completely. You still want to be able to flow basically to your next vowel sound, which is that n. Mm. So this is like uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh, mountain, cotton, eaten, forgotten. See how the breath is just able to keep moving. The held T sound can also occur though when you have a T at the end of a word. Cut, cut, cut. Cut, sit, 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 white, 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 white. The held T also occurs when you have a T that comes before a consonant sound. Sit with, sit with, sit with, sit with. Batman, Batman. Batman, Batman, dirt bike, dirt bike, dirt bike, dirt bike. But there's another T sound that may even be more frequent than these, and that is called the fast D or the flap T. Basically, what we want to do is we want to pronounce like a D sound, but very, very quickly. Because, don't forget the fundamental rule of American English, we want air to keep flowing. And if you make that D sound too strong, you're going to block the breath and not get the sound you want. 
This fast D sound occurs when you have a vowel followed by a T followed by another vowel. Eat it. Eat it. Eat it. Eat it. Wrote it. Wrote it. Wrote it. Wrote it. Cut it. Cut it. Cut it. Cut it. This fast D sound can also occur when a T comes before an L sound, typically a dark L. Here's a bonus tip. When you make the dark L, try experimenting with having the tip of your tongue down here against the bottom of your mouth behind your top front tooth. This might help you to get more air through. Little, 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 battle, battle. Battle, battle, brittle, 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 brittle. This fast D sound can also occur when you have an R, then a T, then a vowel sound. Forty, 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 party, 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 flirty. Flirty, flirty, flirty. Let's get some practice with T sounds now. I'm going to show you a sentence, give you some time to think about how you would say it with these four different T's, then say for you a possible answer. It was a little lucky he got it. It was a little lucky he got it. That wasn't the mountain I wanted. That wasn't the mountain I wanted. I don't know if two kittens are better. I don't know if two kittens are better. Twenty ten was not my favorite. 2010 was not my favorite. Which of these T sounds did you find to be the most difficult? Be sure to let us know in the comments. Okay, that's round three. Stay tuned for the judge's final decision. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss the judge's final decision and our future battles. Click subscribe now. Let's go to round three. I'll start with Judge Gideon. The videos blew me away. They were they were great. They were really great to do the standard video they did in four hours to the level of detail was extraordinary. And I'm not someone who's guessing because I've made more than 200 videos. And I know it could take a week to do something half decent, if others consider it half decent. So... The fact that they did something of such high quality in a short time absolutely blew me away. They were both great. Uh, Jeff's video, I learned a lot. It was it, this. This was uh, about the T, wasn't it? The um, the the flat T and the silent T and the slap T. I don't know the, the all the T's, uh, but <laughs> so much information that I didn't even know. I, I felt I learned a lot. I came away from it thinking, well. Wow, that's great. I know. I know something. Now I can go out and teach American English. But as for Colin, wow, not only not only did he explain it all, this was the double negatives, um, explain it all. He also did a sketch. Did you see the sketch? He did it. He managed to get in a mm. sketch with uh, just the Scouser doing double negatives, a bit unfair on Scousers, but, you know, the, uh, the Liverpool accent, you know, Scouser. And, um, and he sang a song. He sang Lady Gaga. You should be careful because um, he may get um, demonetized or might be a copy strike, strike. I think Lady Gaga may come after him. Not saying he's going to get any special points for his Creative. singing, <laughs> for his singing, but no, the fact that he did sing, 
the fact that he stepped out the box, he took a risk, mm -hmm. uh, that was, he went um, beyond the call of duty. Uh, content was great. He talked about negatives. I thought he could have mentioned uh, all, because de double negatives is um, about emphasis. He could have mentioned something like uh, we could use what um, whatsoever. Um, I, instead of using a de double negative, I don't know nothing, doesn't know anything whatsoever. So there, maybe there could be one or two small things he could have. Uh, but, but on the whole, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Fluency MC, yeah. how, do you, how did you feel about our videos or the videos the challenger submitted? Yeah, yeah, well, I fully agree uh, with what Gideon said about how how well they did with the short time they had. I mean, uh, I I don't make videos like that because I don't I, don't, I can't spend that much time in my life uh, making them. I'd love to, but uh, so yeah, so uh, hats off uh, to both of them for sure. Uh, they both did, did did a really good job, uh, but yeah, let's talk. Let's start talking about the uh, yeah. Let's start with Collins. Um, you know, he started. He, he began by saying he, he wanted to focus on you know strict rules versus modern usage, which I thought uh, is, is so important with double negatives. You know, there are enough double negative videos where it's like this is wrong, this is wrong, don't say this, don't say that. So you know, he he, he got into the nuances really well. Uh, I love the wigs. I love the sketch. I I, I wish there had been a couple more sketches. I feel like if he had the wig, you know, why not? You know, do a couple more examples. Uh, so you know that that's just one little thing. Just because I liked it so much, you know, why not do it? Do it more. It's, you know, it's very very well prepared, especially with the time he had. Uh, very professional. Uh, and yeah, the we, he talked about uh, one thing I was waiting for, and I was glad it came is the you know the context and the tone um, for, when he's talking about the correct double negatives. I was a little worried, you know, uh, when he's saying there are some that are correct, and then I I get oh I get what you're saying. It's like uh, uh, I forget the example now. It's not important, but he he made that very clear. Um, so yeah, so so the ways I would prove it, I feel like if you are a learner, it could get a little confusing without seeing like maybe the incorrect, the double negative sentences in red or crossed out or something like, you know, to, just to distinguish a little bit more with the graphics. And sometimes, you know, he had this sort of very empty space and I was like, and then as at the top, he had like a little font of like what he was talking about. So I think maybe a little bit more uh, with anim anim animated text, just for, you know, more learners can see what he's uh, saying. I think, I, guess uh, you could... I think that, that that takes time. I think from per the all true. This animated that, true. that take, that's true. Take You're right. Time. So maybe, so maybe that's something the, he would have done constraints. if he had more time. Yeah. yeah, I guess I should be careful not to to critique on that stuff. That's true. That's true. Um, with when he's talking about, I, I agree with what Didion Didion said about uh, talking more maybe about the the uh, emphasis how double negatives are used. Uh, but but one thing that I, he said that they're used in other languages for emphasis, um, you know, he said gave French and Spanish as an example, but actually they're just standard. Um, you know, you can't you can't make a, a a negative sentence without using double negatives most most of the time. So that that was something. But I don't think he needed to really talk about other languages. If he did, then he, if he, if he wanted to, he probably should have said that. Um, the yeah, so. Yeah, the, the the history. He's talking about the history. I guess it depends on the level. You know, if I'm if I'm a high level learner, maybe be interested in sort of some of the uh, things he was saying. If I were a low level learner and I just sort of wanted to practice, there wasn't so it was it wasn't a, it was more of an explanation. Uh, I, I felt like maybe it could have been balanced a little bit, a little bit more that way. Um, but it was a great video, great job, uh, Colin, uh, Jeff. Uh, immediately you say it takes time <laughs> but immediately again maybe it's experience you know an animated text graphics no, for Jeff is right. just you know outstanding so yeah you could argue it takes time or you could argue that he just you know he's more experienced or that you know so he could do it faster or who knows um you know but maybe Connell would say oh you're right you know I don't put enough text up in my videos generally even when I have a lot of time you know I don't know but Jeff is uh, obviously a master of that, um, you know, keeping people's attention, like the colors, the um, it's just amazing. So both of them are professional, uh, but uh, the look of Jeff's, I 
I, I prefer maybe because I've seen so many like chalk and talks, not to disparage what Colin did, but you know, there's sort of a lot of that out there. So as a learner, I'm, I'm looking more at something like Jeff's doing. However, as a learner, I would be really into what Jeff was doing, but I might be a little confused. <laughs> uh, and not because Jeff doesn't know what he's talking about, uh, because he knows so well what he's talking about. Uh, it really just depends on the audience. So uh, Gideon, when you said that you learned something from it, same as me, I felt it was almost a better teacher training video uh, mm. than it was a video for students, unless that student is, and this is who Jeff's audience is. So that's why I think it's okay. Yeah. You know, a, a very high level student who can watch something like that, you know, and see examples of the hell tea and the silent tea and, and not feel overwhelmed. Like the, the average English language student that I have uh would watch that and be like what the hell is going on like it's just it's way it's way too technical and in the end and this is my my main criticism about it uh in the end when he's saying let's practice and try to notice when is it a hell t when is it a silent t when is it right uh you know as he showed through the video you can say most of them any of those ways and be understood so i feel like that's not emphasized enough uh again thinking of the learner that I'm imagining stumbling upon that. If it's someone, you know, if it's, if it's for that high level person who's really trying to refine uh, their accent or somebody interested in, you know, applied linguistics who wants to see, you know, that, that, but, but, but the learner okay. who stumbles on that, I feel like there's a chance they could be like, Oh my God, I'll never be able to speak clearly. Cause I don't, I don't understand the difference between this stuff. Okay. So okay, anyway, I mean that yeah, go ahead. Just a, yeah. just a question for you, because um, I'm assuming people come come to Jeff for this very reason that they they want to you know step up. They're already speaking right. this very well uh, because I know that the people I teach here in Paris, most of them would not be interested in that level of detail yeah. because they're still struggling with you know present perfect in past simple but but but, but, basic, but more but, more to the point the, the risk to me is that maybe they would be interested in it and then they wouldn't focus on the things that are right right in, 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 you know that are interfering with their comprehensibility mm. or or other things about pronunciation you know i mean right. i'm biased because i'm a i'm a, i'm really big on on super segmentals on rhythm on, okay. on intonation okay. as as needing much more attention than like you know where you put your tongue and and all of that because i feel like most errors in terms of comprehension uh i have to do with that i think what this is about for me is like we're, we didn't say to them make a video for this level we didn't say to them make a video for this these first language speakers we didn't say anything right about that yeah. so so if, if if we didn't that means jeff's making a video for his for, audience for his audience and so I, the things I just said are kind of irrelevant if his audience is like that kind of detail is exactly what I need uh, to to improve my English. Yeah. Is that the best video on the on the on the T sounds for the average learner? Absolutely not. Exactly. As you said, Judge Fluency, he was catering for his his audience. Mm. But let's yeah. say I'm I'm someone who's I just want to learn English and I'm typing this into YouTube and this video pops up. Am I going to be scared? <laughs> Am I going to be <laughs> like, intrigued? English is impossible. Oh my God, I can <laughs> never Exactly. So I do think there should be a overall consideration, like mm. not just low level, not high level, but yeah. a general but level where everyone... I, I think that's a little, little harsh on Jeff, to be fair. Because uh, he, yeah, especially since we didn't say that. I mean, we I didn't think, say I think that. His his I, I think if we said to Jeff, the, Jeff, make yeah. if we said to Jeff, make a video on the four T sounds. Yeah, that would work for you know uh, an intermediate student. You know, for an A two. Exactly, would have done it differently. Sure, he surely. would never have done that because he just yeah. he knows he knows so much. He knows so much uh, as a teacher. So so. Uh, in, in, so maybe that's more about about us like maybe when we say go and do this we need to think more about how we tell them to go and do it um, because they are going to follow their brand they are going to exactly so as you said considering his brand his teaching yeah. spot yeah. on yeah, yeah. Same absolutely with yeah. Colin. 
I'm so sorry. so let me just say so then since I said so many things uh, uh, that I'm not going to take into consideration now in my score because we agree <laughs> it's for their audiences that's for his audience I think they would love it uh, I think I think a, I love how he talked he did practice uh, I think even a little bit more practice, uh, less explanation might have been good. Uh, but I have to even say, as good as it was, I think even a high level student, because me as a teacher, I'm not a pronunciation guru, but I've been training teachers for years. Um, it, it was a little, because it was so fast, it was a little confusing at times uh, to follow. So I'm just imagining if you are uh, someone with a, you know, really trying to refine your native accent, um, but your English level uh, is, I don't know, he was speaking pretty slowly, though. I, mean, I really, it was, it was great. I mean, again, if we, if we're looking at as his audience, really looking at the specifics about the tea, it was, it was fantastic. Okay. And beautiful, beautiful, the way he uses uh, uh, video. Yeah, his, his editing skills are oh, something yeah. else. Yeah. So, so, so one thing I think is misleading uh, maybe the only major thing I thought was misleading about what Jeff in Jeff's videos, when you talk about the fast T, you know, it's, it's, it's fast. It's not just about fast. I mean, to, you know, it's, it, would we say, would we ever say, you know, put it down? I mean, it's, it's put it down. I mean, it's because of the linking. So I think he, he, he I understand he's, he's, he, he never mentions connected, linked and connected speech. Like his thing is, sounds individual sounds but i do feel maybe misleading is a harsh uh, not, not the right word but i, I feel like the, a better way to explain that is not you can say it, the 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 you can pronounce it uh as a as a pronounced t or a fast t or a help. Like, i think a lot of a lot of times the examples he's giving uh without explaining that it's because of of, of linking i mean he does mention it but i feel like it's it's not speed I mean, I can say, put it down, put it down, put it down. But I would never, when I slow down, I would never say, put it down. It's not about fast. So I think it could be a little misleading talking about uh, the speed. Uh, maybe a little bit more uh, talking about how how uh, words uh, sh uh, shrink and link, as I like to say. So Judge Gideon, who takes round three? Jeff, as I said, great. I I don't have that level of expertise for the, the phonetics, of the, even though I make pronunciation videos in more in general terms. Um, but the, his his level of, of skill in the phonetics and all the, the sounds and the aspirations, um, it, it was great. And learning about American English as well, American pronunciation. So it was great. Learned a lot. I haven't got much to criticize because maybe because I just don't have that skill. Uh, also, we did take into account it was it was made over a short period of time. So I'm going to give him four. And Colin, <clears throat> great video. Uh, I said he could have mentioned something that he didn't, but I'm not going to mark him down for that because overall, given the time constraints, even, even if there weren't time constraints, this was a, an exceptional video. It was uh, adventurous, um, courageous, and he sort of put himself out there. And just because he took these risks... <clears throat> just because he 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 was prepared to do something um more uh daring uh and audacious uh with with his sketches and particularly his singing not fantastic singing but singing nevertheless uh, i'm going to give him five i really appreciate when someone is prepared to you know, risk making a fool of themselves. Uh, I, <laughs> I make a fool of myself a, a lot, a lot, but I, I do, uh, I do appreciate that, that. So I'm giving him the extra point for, for that very reason. I can definitely see with more time. And again, is it? It'd be interesting to, to sort of have a follow up about the videos with them because you know, with is it more time or is it more experience? Like, would 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 Colin say, "Oh, you know what? I I I." I don't use, and I haven't followed either of these guys enough to know what they usually do. And I guess I can go look at their videos more carefully, but, um, you know, uh, would Colin say, oh, it's not that I didn't have enough time. I just, I really don't think about how learners need to see more, more text on the screen and more different differentiation with colors maybe. And, you know, I, I need to work on that or if it's time. So I think with time, you know, that video could be even better. It's a great video. Um, I think, I think with Jeff, um, you know, 
if he had more time, I don't think that video would be that different, to be honest. Like, I think he's 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 definitely uh, super skilled and, and, and knows what he wants to do. Um, and like I said before, I have to be careful. Like, my score for, for that video would be very different uh, if um, we had said to him, you know, this needs to be a, a very simple, practical video for his pronunciation for, you know, to hit people even at, you know, intermediate or lower levels that, you know, but, but it wasn't, we didn't say that. So he made it for his audience. Jeff, Jeff's uh, video, uh, I would give a four. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, to, to me, like, you know, if, 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 if it had talked uh, a little bit more about super segmentals, if it had not been so detailed about the phonemes, but I know that's what his, his brand is, then uh, maybe even a five. I mean, his videos are, are really great, really, really great. Uh, I would give Collins a four. Colin could make that video a five. I understand uh, and I agree with, with Gideon. I, I appreciate his enthusiasm, taking a risk. Um, still, um, it's it's a it's a five video that's not quite a five yet to me, like the things that he would need to do to kind of make it better. Um, but uh, but yeah, so so four fours fours for each of them, four four. <laughs> now let's count the total points, and it is a draw. So 22 to Jeff, 22 to Colin. We have come to the conclusion that the challengers are tied. So we don't have a champion for this battle. We have two challengers who were equally great and did a great job altogether. So the judges have decided to keep it at a tie. To everyone watching, if you'd like to join Battle English as a challenger or even a spectator, go to our website, wespeakenglish.com battle English and discover what battle ready English looks like. Stay tuned for more Battle English. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss the next battle. Thank you to everyone who participated in this battle. We look forward to seeing you in the next one. Battle English at WeSpeakEnglish.com Do you agree with the judge's decision? Write a comment under this video and tell us your opinion. Learn more about Battle English at WeSpeakEnglish.com